I'm about to bring Angela on from the Xerxes Society. Um, but we had this dream last year and uh, COVID interrupted it, like it interrupted a lot of things. We had this dream where we would gather volunteers and they would help us bag milkweed and they would help us find these locations. And we didn't end up doing it with volunteers because of COVID, but we did have interns and we were able to hire some staff. So like I said, we did collect, you know, hundreds of thousands of seed last year. And um, with those, we're growing plants. So we're able to give out some seed packets and whatnot. But depending on how things change this year, we would love to develop a group of uh, milkweed hunters, right? Um, not just from narrowleaf milkweed, because we kind of found that. But we do, because we have access to so much land being part or being partners with the National Recreation Area, the National Parks, we have access to land. And like Tax said, we shouldn't really be going off trail. But we do have an idea of where it should occur. We know in areas where it sh we should find it. If we can look at a landscape and go, oh, there's some oak trees there. It's slight. Um, there's a little bit of a decline, like a slope. But it looks like there's a little bit of shade. And it looks like a slightly mulchy or area where the, the oaks might be dropping their leaves. That could be an ideal spot for Asclepias californica because it, it looks like the other spots that we found. So um, I would just stay tuned with us, um, reach out to us through our email and look for our volunteer opportunities because we do want to develop this team of folks that we welcome onto our national recreation area in a COVID safe manner and help us find these milkweeds, just like this population right here that you can see the picture of and we bag the seeds as they're ready. And then we take them back and, and you know, germinate them and hopefully just produce more and more seed. Tack, big hug, brother. Thank you so much for doing this. I appreciate it. Um, if, feel free to hang out in the Q&A if people have questions that we didn't answer. Um, right now, at this moment, I would like to introduce Miss Angela Laws. Angela, uh, Angela Laws is an endangered species conservation biologist and the climate change lead for the Xerces Society. Based in Sacramento, California, Angela is working on habitat restoration for pollinators and monarch butterflies in California. She received an MS in ecology from Utah State University and a PhD in biology from the University of Notre Dame. Dr. Laws, thank you so much for joining us this morning. Take it away. Okay, can you hear me? Yep, sounds good. Yeah, Leslie, we may need to stop. There we go. Okay. Thanks, everyone, for, for being here today and for inviting me to be a part of this great conference. I'm going to talk a little bit about restoring habitat for monarchs and some of the basics. So just first, what is Xerces? We are a nonprofit focused on protecting biodiversity by protecting invertebrates. Most of our work is focused on pollinators. We have a large pollinator team, but we also have teams dedicated to pesticide reduction and endangered species. I'm on the endangered species team. And we do a lot of outreach, education, advocacy. We do a lot of on the ground uh, restoration work. Much of our pollinator team works uh, in working lands to create habitat for monarchs and other pollinators and beneficial insects. So I'm sure you've seen this already today. Monarchs are not doing so hot. Uh, these are data from the Western Monarch Thanksgiving count, which uh, Xerxes started with Mia Monroe from the National Park um, System. So you can see when we started this in 97, there are approximately 1.2 million monarchs along the coast. In the 1980s, it was estimated that there were 4 million monarchs overwintering along the coast. And that number kind of dipped down to 200,000. And then in 2018, the population crashed to less than 30,000. Then again, last uh, winter, the numbers declined to less than 2,000. So the situation is grim, but there is a lot we can do. Insects tend to be resilient. Their numbers can bounce around a lot. So that means that they do have the capacity to recover. And the nice thing I think about working with insects is that habitat that we create in small spaces can be really meaningful. There's a lot we can do in our everyday lives to support monarchs and pollinators. And it can make a difference, especially here in California, which is such an important part of the range. So when the numbers dropped um, in 2018, 
we came up with our Western Monarch Call to Action with the five actions we thought would contribute most to monarch conservation. So those include protecting and managing the overwintering sites in California. These sites have no formal protection and every year sites continue to get lost or degraded. So they need to be actively managed. Uh, we need to restore breeding and migratory habitat in California. We need to protect monarchs and their habitat from pesticides. We need to protect the breeding habitat in the West outside of California, but California is really a key part of this. Um, and we need to continue doing research so that we can um, improve our management recommendations over time. So I'm gonna focus on these two, protecting habitat and then pesticides protection goes hand in hand with that. There are many opportunities to create monarch habitat including in our cities and towns. So it's not something that only needs to happen in pristine natural areas. Urban areas can provide really great habitat for pollinators and some urban areas have really high diversity of bees and other pollinators. And there's so many places where we can have habitats. So most people think about their yards, but if you don't have a yard, that doesn't mean you can't get involved because there's so many places where we can add habitat. Public gardens, parks, schools, many schools now are starting to have um, pollinator gardens or vegetable gardens are offices. This is a picture of monarch habitat in an office building in Oregon. I think it would be really great if our retailers started to transition from that standard landscaping they all do to native plants that support pollinators and other wildlife. The uh, church's rights of way, so um, land under power lines or along roadsides can be great pollinator habitat and abandoned lots um, and other, other places. So as you start looking around the community, I think you'll see a lot of opportunities to create habitat and use that space so that we're sharing um, our communities with the pollinators that, that do so much for us. And of course, um, in natural areas as well, we have some um, guidance for managing monarchs in the West in natural areas and grazing lands. I'm going to put all of, I'm, I'm going to talk about several publications that we have, and when I'm finished, I'll put links to all of these in the chat box. But then cropland can also uh, be a great place to add pollinator habitat, and every day we work with really great farmers who are committed to protecting pollinators on their lands. So places like hedgerows, field margins, um, unused corners of, of uh, buildings, or er, um, where buildings are can be great places to add habitat. We do have a guide to creating habitat on farms in the Central Valley, but I think a lot of that guidance might also be applicable to uh, farms generally in California. So what does high quality monarch breeding habitat look like? It has native milkweed, of course, that's the plant that the caterpillars need um, for food. Adults will take nectar from the monarchs, but of course the adults are generalists. They take nectar from a variety of plants, so they need nectar plants. Um, things that are going to be blooming throughout the migratory and breeding season when they're going to be there. They need safe habitat that's protected from pesticides and high levels of pathogens. For example, um, because tropical milkweed doesn't senesce, especially in Southern California where it's nice and sunny all year, uh, there's a parasite called OE that tends to build up. So you get higher rates of disease in areas with tropical milkweed. I saw that Antonio suggested cutting it down to the ground in November. That's one good compromise. Um, and then they need other features for shade and perching. So I'm going to talk about each of these. So again, we suggest planting native milkweed. And it sounds like you just got some really amazing detailed information about establishing and growing milkweed in Southern California, which is amazing. It's a great resource. Um, narrow leaf milkweed is your best bet. It's gonna be the most readily commercially available. But woolly pod and California milkweed are also um, options for your area that are um, historically native. Uh, in Southern California, we recommend you don't plant milkweed at overwintering sites. They don't need it in their overwintering sites. Um, they do need nectar, though. And we recommend, when possible, trying to plant multiple species, especially if you're doing some habitat work in a large area, because the more species of milkweed that you have, 
each of those species is going to have a different phenology, meaning they're going to be emerging or flowering at different times. So if you have different species, you're more likely to prolong the amount of time during the year when you have milkweed available. Um, we are doing some work to expand the commercial availability of California milkweed, and it sounds like there's some great efforts um, in Southern California as well, which is really important to get different ecotypes, right? We've been collecting California milkweed in the Bay Area. That's not necessarily going to be the best option for planting in San Diego area, right? So I think um, supporting those efforts that Antonio talked about for collecting these seeds is really going to help support monarchs by making those other species of milkweed more readily available for, for home gardeners and others doing restoration work. Of course, nectar plants are important. Adult monarchs need nectar, and um, having a variety of plants is a great way to support monarchs. This one was taken in my yard just like two weeks ago, uh, feeding on my coyote mint, which is very exciting. So you just wanna make sure you have a variety of plants blooming from spring through fall. If you're at or near an overwintering site, Try to have things that are blooming in winter because they will drink um, nectar in the winter. We think that um, nectar sources early spring and late fall are especially important for supporting the migration. And you guys know it's so hot and dry in California in the fall when they're heading back to the overwintering sites, there's not always a lot blooming on the landscape. So this is um, something really important to think about. On our website, we have some plant lists of nectar plants that monarchs like. We also have some um, plant lists for pollinators in general, because as a lot of you probably know, monarchs are declining, but there are many other species of butterflies and bees and other pollinators in California that also need our help. That's the nice thing is because when we create habitat for monarchs, it's gonna support many other pollinators. Shade, so planting some trees or shrubs to provide some shade can be really valuable. Um, monarchs tend to like to perch in these trees to get some shade, get some relief from the heat. There's some evidence that monarchs will preferentially lay their eggs on shaded milkweed. So that's really um, can be beneficial. This is a picture of a natural area in Sacramento area. And I think you can see um, in the front, we have some showy milkweed that's all senesced. It's all dry and dead. But behind that, um, in the shade of these oak trees, a lot of the milkweed is still green. And so I think that might be another bonus is that if you have some shaded areas that can prolong the season when the milkweed is available for the monarchs. And then of course, we need to protect the habitat from pesticides. It's really important. And we recommend you avoid using pesticides for cosmetic reasons around your homes. Most insecticides are broad spectrum, which means they kill a wide range of insects. So maybe you're spraying something because you don't want aphids, but it's also likely to kill pollinators. And many of those insecticides stay in the environment for a really long time. And I know it's something you don't really think about. You think you spray it, it works, and then it's gone. But that's not always the case, especially with um, pesticides like neonicotinoids. They can stay in the environment for months or even years. I'll talk a little bit more about those in a minute. So this is a thing. I think that when people think of pesticides, they think of agriculture, but actually our cities and towns can have pesticide levels that are just as high or higher than we find in agricultural areas. And this is an area where I think we have a lot of power to move the needle here, right? We can talk to our community leaders, our neighbors, business owners, landlords about reducing pesticide use. And that will make such a big difference for monarchs and other um, wildlife. So we wanted to know, okay, are monarchs encountering milk pesticides and milkweed in the Central Valley? Uh, we collaborated with Matt Forrester and Chris Halsich, which are two biologists at the University of Nevada, Reno. And we um, basically went out in June, 2019, and we collected the leaves from 227 milkweed plants. So a lot of different plants, we collected them from urban areas, agricultural areas, natural areas, and from nurseries. So we wanted to see, you know, what is the potential pesticide pressure that monarch caterpillars are experiencing in the Central Valley? And what we found was that out of 227 plants, every single sample had pesticides. There's not one sample that didn't have pesticides on it. 
with an average of nine different pesticides per plant, which was really shocking to us. Um, 64 different pesticides total. The um, samples with the highest number of pesticides were one agricultural roadside site and the um, milkweed that we purchased from nurseries, which had about 25 different pesticides on them. So this is really problematic when we're thinking about protecting the species. We need to provide it with habitat that's protected. And, you know, I'm just talking about presence or absence. So the concentration or the amount of pesticides also vary among these different types of sites. Even when the amount of pesticide is at a lethal level, if it's sub-lethal, so it's not going to kill the monarch, it can still have a lot of negative effects on that animal and affect its ability to um, bounce back, right? So this brings up some um, problems like pesticide drift. Okay, so <laughs> I said we collected from urban areas. We collected some milkweed from the backyard of my coworker who has lived in her house and does not spray. She's been in her house for 10 years. She doesn't use pesticides. There are a lot of different pesticides on the milkweed, and she was very upset. But that's because of drift. When you spray a pesticide, it doesn't just stay there. It can drift. So what's in your yard is not just what you're using. It's what all your neighbors are using. It's what the city is using. Um, it's all of this together, which is why I think um, we need to, like, some community level efforts to educate people. You know, it's not just monarchs. I wouldn't would want my pet family members around this either. And then the other issue is something called uh, these neonicotinoids are an especially problematic type of systemic insecticides. So when I talk about systemic insecticides, what does that mean? Well, it means that if you spray a plant, maybe spray the leaves, the plant takes it up and expresses it in all the tissues. So maybe the leaf got sprayed, but now the pollen and the nectar are also going to have those pesticides in them. The other thing that happens with neonicotinoids, they're long-lived, so they're gonna stick around for months, um, sometimes years in pieces where they're sprayed on trees. What happens is maybe you take a plant home from the nursery, it's been treated with neonicotinoids, you plant it, those pesticides get into the soil and get taken up by all the plants surrounding the plant. So now you're spreading this pesticide in this habitat where you're trying to create to benefit monarchs. And so this is something that uh, we need to be thinking about. Um, we can, one way to address this is making sure that we're buying bee safe plants, um, bee safe pollinator safe, monarch safe, all the same thing. Um, so we need to be talking with our nurseries or careful about where we're purchasing our plants to make sure that when we're buying plants for pollinator habitat, that it's gonna be safe for those pollinators. So some simple steps to do that are to seek out organic plants and seeds, avoid plants grown with neonicotinoids and other similar systemic insecticides because those are gonna be really harmful to pollinators that can stick around and talk to talk to the people working at the nursery ask them what steps they are taking to offer pollinator friendly plants what are their pest management strategies and I think we have a lot of power here right because if nurseries start hearing from more and more people that this is something consumers want I think they're going to pay attention to that so we have two great new fact sheets to help you one is on buying bee safe plants so it goes through the different Pesticides you need to worry about. It talks about questions to ask at your nursery. It talks about how to start that conversation. And then we also have a guide for nurseries who want to offer uh, bee safe plants. So if you know so this is something that you can take with you um, and, and give to the nursery to try and start that conversation. I'll post links to these as well. Okay, so that those are sort of the basics of, of monarch habitat, right? You need native milkweed. You need nectar plants, especially early spring, late fall. You need to avoid <laughs> spraying your habitat with pesticides and try and um, harass your neighbors and ask them not to spray um, your habitat as well. Um, Xerces does a lot of work. I just want to talk briefly about the work we do to create habitat for monarchs. We work throughout California. Um, much of our work is in agricultural areas. This is the green um, symbols on the map there. 
Uh, we have partner biologists with the NRCS that can help create pollinator habitats. So if any of you um, have working lands, you can contact us. We can help you create habitat on your, um, on your land. We also developed a program called Be Better Certified, which is a, it's a third party certified uh, set of standards to show that you are producing food in a way that, um, that prioritizes the protection of pollinators. And we have some products on the market, we've got some blueberries, and, um, other products that are already out that are Be Better Certified. Uh, as I mentioned, we're working to expand the ability of some milkweed varieties. We work with land managers to improve management for monarchs and pollinators. Right now, uh, we have a grant to work with several state parks to improve their management plans for overwintering sites so that we can actively manage these uh, groves to protect monarchs long term. And we have a project um, called our Xerces Habitat Kit Program. So these marks and stars are the um, areas where people have received kits. So basically, we provide plant materials to people who are doing restoration work. Um, so we work with people who are creating habitat on working lands or public spaces, like natural areas or school gardens. Oftentimes, there are people already out there, really knowledgeable people doing really great work. The native plants can be expensive and that can be a barrier to doing habitat on the ground. So we kind of came up with this idea as a way to like increase the amount of habitat that's happening out there. So in the last two years, 2019 and 2020, we gave away over 72,000 plants, supporting 55 projects in natural areas, urban areas, ag areas. This picture is a planting at Delta College, which is um, in the Central Valley. Uh, it's gonna be a pollinator habitat, but also used as outdoor class space. So we're doing it again this year. We just finished reading through applications. Uh, we have 12 projects in Southern California that are getting funded this year. Some really great projects in the community gardens and some school gardens. Um, it was a vineyard in there. So a lot of great projects. Um, if this is something that you're interested in, email me. Our next round of applications will be open in April. So we take applications in April and then uh, the plants are ready in the fall. So November, early November. Um, so this is just another opportunity if you have an idea of some place that you can do some work but maybe don't have funds to get the plants, um, you can watch for this program next year. And then of course, just to plug for our community science project for monarchs, the Western Monarch Milkweed Mapper. You know, up until a few years ago, most of the information we had about monarchs was about the Eastern monarchs. And this great effort by community science scientists all over the West has really helped us learn a lot about the biology of the species and improve our management recommendations. So if you see a monarch or a milkweed, you can log it on the mapper. You can also use iNaturalist, which is <laughs> a lot more user-friendly. So if you're on iNat, you can join the Western Monarch Milkweed Mapper Project, and that will send the data um, to this database, which is open, open source. So if you also want the data for something, um, it's, it's there if you're a researcher and um, looking for information, uh, you can check out this website. And I just want to thank all of you for listening and to all of our members that make our work possible. Thank you. Angela, thank you very much for that presentation. We're going to have a few questions for you, Angela, if it's cool. Um, we also, we're also getting a little bit of static from your end, I believe, maybe you know from. What? Let me turn up the AC. <laughs> okay, it's all good. <laughs> maybe that's it. If if it's a if it's a little monarch caterpillar, just leave it. But if it's not, um, is that is that better? I'll try and stand near the speaker. It sounds about the same, but it's not it's not too bad, Angela. Okay. Um, Sorry, so I, I came wanted, into the office. <laughs> I just wanted to let people know that. Um, there are a few resources in the chat box as far as where you can find seed. There was someone who said they were giving live plants away, it sounded like. If that person could repost, maybe we could uh, clip it so it stays in the chat so people can find it easily. Um, 
And some people were concerned about what we were doing as far as collecting in our national parkland, about collecting too much seed. And because a million seeds sounds like a lot of seed, and it is. Um, but if you guys know milkweed, you know one little pod can create like 100 to 200 seed on each pod um, if we collect it correctly and it's healthy seed. So if you just do the math on that, and there's tens of thousands of milkweed plants out here, um, we definitely do not want to take more than we need to. But um, it's a tiny amount that we're taking. And our goal is to seed bulk it in a seed farm that we have to where we have, so we don't have to take so much from, from uh, native nature. But I think um, if you could just reemphasize two points, Angela, um, tropical milkweed, what is Xerxes' stance? And coastal, coastal plantings. Um, I think people are having a little bit of a, a hard time distinguishing. And I'm gonna give a talk, I think at 1.30 or something about pollinator plants, right? Which is, <laughs> I see it as the, as coffee in the morning for the monarchs. And then the milkweed plant, which is the food, right? I, I, so if you could talk a little bit about coastal, what they should be planting yeah. and then tropical. Right, so we do not recommend planting tropical milkweed. I think there are two problems with it. So it doesn't senesce in the winter, it stays green year round. And so monarchs can have this parasite called OE on them. So they visit the milkweed, the OE gets on the plant, and it builds up over time. And so when other monarchs come in, they can pick up that parasite. Um, that's one reason why we suggest if you, if you have it in your yard and you don't want to replace it, to cut it down um, in the fall. It just is hard to do if you have monarchs visiting your yard. You have to have a hard stone to cut back that <laughs> tropical milkweed. So that's one thing. The other thing is there's some evidence that it might disrupt the migration. There's a study in Texas where areas with tropical milkweed near the coast had year-round resident monarchs, and monarchs coming through in the migration tended to stop there. They had higher rates of disease coming in and then uh, became reproductive. So when monarchs um, are headed to the overwintering sites, they're in reproductive diapause. It's like a holding pattern. So they're not reproducing, they're just kind of like holding. You gotta wait until the spring. And there's some evidence that tropical milkweed can disrupt that. So we recommend just planting the native species where they're historically native. In terms of the coast, north of Santa Barbara, our rule of thumb is not to plant milkweed within five miles of the coast. South of Santa Barbara, our, our rule of thumb is one mile of the coast or Within one mile, I mean, <laughs> when you look at Google shots of, of the coast, it's, <laughs> a lot of times it's just homes there. There's not <laughs> groves left. So if you can avoid planting milkweed in Southern California um, near the overwintering sites, they just don't need it, right? They need, they need nectar during the winter. They don't need to be providing, they don't need to be reproducing, so they don't need milkweed. Um, so I... That's our recommendation. Our rule of thumb is in Southern California to avoid planting it uh, within a mile of the coast. If there's no overwintering sites nearby, which you can check on our Thanksgiving Monarch Count website, it's an interactive map of overwintering sites, um, then it's probably fine. I, I think the bigger issue is replacing tropical milkweed with native milkweed. Perfect. And yeah, Hopefully that's a little bit is really important. Sorry. Yeah. yeah, no, no. Um, I'm using I'm using your guys' sheet in the afternoon as a reference for the pollinator, the nectars for um, for late and early. Um, yeah. Can you put up Can you put up that screen while we're talking of your two new sheets for Be Safe? Because I think that's super powerful for people to just print out or even have on their phone. You know what I found? Yeah. I've been in the nursery. I've been in the nursery world for over 15 years, and what I found, you know, people get a bad rap like the big box stores like oh they don't care they don't water their stuff i'm gonna disagree most people that i've found who either work in big box stores watering plants or just have worked at a local nursery for years they care they they love plants and while it's hard for us to change and we feel bad like oh we've been selling the wrong plant if you come at them correctly and you come at them as a friend a lot of folks they they want to help you they want to sell you the plant that you want and so I think these uh, these things that uh, these uh, sheets that you guys have produced are super um, easy to easy to use, um, and yeah. they're on your website, right? Yep. And I put in the chat I put a link to 
all of the things that I talked about. So there is a link to these in the plant, but in, in the um, chat. But you can just, if you Google Be Safe Plants on our website, these will come up. But yeah, they have a list of questions to ask. I think a lot of people just don't, you don't think about it. And another thing maybe is being less picky about the plants that you buy in terms of maybe it has some insect damage on it and you accept that it doesn't have to be a pristine plant, but it's safe for pollinators and monarchs. Um, and like Antonio said, yeah, I think I agree. I think a lot of people care about pollinators. They want to do the right thing and, and maybe they just don't know. So yeah, that's what the other guide is for, for nurseries to give them some suggestions. And our pollinator team is amazing. Um, they work with people all the time on integrated pest management. So if you in a situation where you want to come up with better practices, um, we, can, we can help you with that. Yeah, I'm gonna ask Izzy to jump in with a question in just a second. Right. I wanna cover two things. Someone mentioned that they're having trouble growing stuff from seed. We are gonna cover after lunch, growing stuff from seed. I just wanna give you guys a few tips real quick in case you can't stay um, soaking your seed in warm, not hot water overnight, just like you would frijoles. I, I don't know why all my analogies around beans, but just like <laughs> you do when you cook beans, it helps the, it helps soften. I mean, beans are a lot harder than milkweed seed, but it helps just prime the seed and get them ready for germination. You want to bury your milkweed seed about a quarter inch so that it doesn't see light. And this is just for narrow leaf milkweed. The other ones we'll get into because we do recommend cold stratification for the other ones. But for narrow leaf milkweed, so soak it in warm water overnight, just like you would your beans, and then bury it a quarter inch. And then make sure you sow it during the warm season. And if you don't have warm, you want to provide heat for it. But I would just recommend you just do it in March and April when it's warm. And that should give you a lot more success than what you guys maybe have been seen. Um, so Izzy, any, uh, we have a question for Angela. Yes. Um, Sunny is wondering, are there efforts made to restore or enhance overwintering sites themselves? Should we be planting more trees or other plants in those areas? Yes. So we have a grant from the Wildlife Conservation Board to work with three state parks. Um, in your area, I think it's a what? Um, Rio Carrillo and uh, another one. So we have I three parks. Go ahead. I think it's either Malibu or Magoo, I think, right? <sighs> you know what's on the next slide? San Clemente. So Emma Pelton is our monarch lead. She's doing this work. She's really knowledgeable about the overwintering sites. And she's also working with Pismo Beach. So yeah, they need to be actively managed. And there's a lot of um, pressures that the overwintering sites face, right? We've got drought. Eucalyptus are not necessarily long-lived trees. They're susceptible to um, some disease. So you have drought um, can make them more susceptible to those diseases. There are native trees that the monarchs will roost in. Um, they're slower growing. But they, so there's a lot to think about. You need nectar sources. You need those groves. And then there are other trees surrounding those groves that provide wind barriers. So when trees get cut down or knocked down in storms, um, it can create like wind tunnels, it can change the temperature in those overwintering sites. So they need to be actively managed. And that is one thing we've been doing um, is talking about looking at the trees, are they healthy? Where do we need to start planting more trees? So yes, planting trees is a great way to go about it. Um, it's good to start evaluating where, you know, the health of the trees in those groves, where the wind breaks, where do we need to reinforce that uh, for sure. And then, uh, Winter, winter nectar is a great way to support monarchs in those um, overwintering sites. And then again, if you can advocate with your local community to protect those um, sites, because as of now, they're not formally protected uh, from being cut down for development, wildfire is a problem. Um, so yeah, advocating for your local overwintering site is a great way to support monarchs. Yeah, uh, we, had a, we had a comment about if we're working or somebody working with the Resource Conservation District in Ventura, we are, um, we are, the, in fact, Andy from, from Ventura, RCD is going to give a talk in a few hours about the work being done in Ventura County. Um, right. I think I just wanted to, to end off with, you guys are, <laughs> you guys are a nonprofit, you guys are accepting donations, the work that you guys do is amazing. And you guys still find the the budget <laughs> to give away plants. And can you yeah. go back? 
Yeah, can you go back to that screen? Uh, because for me, making plants affordable, making them available to folks who may not be able to afford them is huge. And there's community garden folks, there's school garden folks, there's just folks who just don't have enough money and they live in perfect, perfect habitat for milkweed. I think if you guys think about that talk that Tat gave where Ashley went and tried to find the milkweed. They said in the 90s, it's probably going to be developed. <laughs> she went a few months ago and it got developed and the milkweed's gone. I don't see that as a lost cause. I see that as hope because they built a parking lot there, but they also left room for trees. I, yeah. see, I see that there's a parking strip there. I see Caltrans starting to make narrowleaf milkweed part of their... I see milkweed up on the I-10, on the 5. I see milkweed in DMV parking lots. I see it in new housing structures, once we get the seed supply, and then these pollinators, right? These pollinator plants for them to sip on as they return and to sip on as they leave. So I see uh, just because we've paved over a lot of it doesn't mean that a lot of our land's still exposed. And I think we have a lot of opportunities just in our parking lots and our front yards to do a lot of damage. So if you could just speak, I know there was a few folks who were interested on getting help with pollinator and milkweed plants. Could you just go over this project one more time? Yeah, so it's our Habitat Kit program, and we started this in 2019 when the monarch numbers were really low, and we're like, what do we do? Like, all of the California staff are already doing as much as they can in terms of putting habitat into the ground. Like, how do we get more habitat in the ground? And then we're like, we have to help other people do it. And there are other people, like really knowledgeable people, like it sounds like you guys are doing amazing work, Antonio. I'm really impressed. Um, so there are all these knowledgeable people who know what they're doing, but maybe they want help picking the right plants or they can't afford plants because as you said, native plants are expensive because they're not as widely available. Like it's hard to find a lot like coyote mint or whatever at Home Depot or wherever you go, like is it going to have the variety of plants that you need so that they cost more. And so that's how we developed this. Um, and it's been really popular. So we've been able to get funding um, to continue this project because it, I just think it's a great way to do this. And habitat is so important, not just for the monarchs, I think that creating habitat and increasing the connectivity, so how close these patches of habitat are to each other, is really important just for the long-term resilience of pollinators in the case of climate change. I think there's the social justice component, right? Because there are parts of our cities and towns that have been overlooked and don't have green spaces, which would be great places to add more habitat. Um, and adding trees is going to help with you know, heat island effects that we get with warming. So I just think there's a lot of benefits here. It gets people involved, it enables the people who are already doing really great work um, to continue doing what they're doing. And so it's, and it's personally speaking, I love working on this project because there are times when I feel like, uh, the world is terrible. <laughs> and then I read these applications and read about all of these people just really dedicated to helping pollinators, making the world better. And it's inspiring to read the applications. So I really love working on this project. Thank you so much, Angela. Um, so if folks want to get a hold of you, or find out about the Xerces project, they should just check back in in April on your guys' website? Yeah, April is usually when we have the applications open. They can email me. You can find my email on the website, but it's angela.laws at xerces.org. So if you have questions or um, concerns. Uh, and, you know, I guess I also want to put in a plug for all the other pollinators that are declining. We have, um, we have, Soon we'll be launching a bumblebee atlas in California. So we have staff, a new staff member, he's in uh, Riverside, who will be running that program. So if you're interested in putting in habitat and then monitoring bumblebees that visit that habitat, um, you can watch our website for that. I'm excited about it. <laughs> All right, uh, Dr. Laws, we could talk forever, I think. I'm yeah. so happy that you got to join us. Um, just a big virtual hug to the whole Xerces family. Thank you guys so much. Um, a round of applause for all of our speakers this morning. Thank you guys so much. We're going to cut out now for our lunch break. We're going to leave our screen on. If you guys want to donate, please go to Xerces.org to donate and fund the amazing projects they're doing there. And we'll also leave our links up if you guys want to find out about the propagation classes we have. 
our oak woodland restoration that we're doing this month and next month, where we'll be planting milkweed seed um, or milkweed seedlings. And, um, you know, any ways that you guys want to help uh, fund our work as well. Thank you, Dr. Laws. Hopefully I'll talk to you soon. All Thank right. You. Thank you guys Bye. very much. So we have our next speaker scheduled for 12. That's going to be our nursery talk about how to make your own and grow your own plants in your own casita, in your own backyard. Um, thank you guys very much. Again, please visit, hold your phone up. The Q, QR code right there will scan it right to the page you want to go to if you want to help fund our work um, or if you want to learn about more of our classes. Thank you guys.
All right, folks, it's 11.52, and we're going to start in about 10 minutes with the afternoon part of Nuestra Conferencia, our beautiful Monarch and Milkweed Conference. It is funny that we have 420 people in here right now. I don't know what that number means, but um, I want to welcome you guys and thank you for hanging around. We're going to send out a poll in just a few minutes. Um, and we'll definitely get to some of these questions uh, that you guys have. Um, please, if you're interested, put your phone up um, on up to the screen and scan the QR code that you guys are seeing right now on your screen. And some of those codes will take you right to a spot where you can donate to the nonprofit that I work at and that Izzy and Leslie and Ashley who are helping to coordinate this work at. Um, and you can help fund the mission milkweed that we have this year for trying to collect and grow um, seed of the three different local milkweeds. And you guys can check out some of the free classes that we're offering too on growing stuff from seed and cuttings, doing landscape maintenance, which I think is a very important uh, thing with native plants so that we have a native plant uh, maintenance class um, and then some habitat restoration projects that we have going on this summer. Uh, restoring oak woodland here in uh, the Newbury Park, Thousand Oaks area while planting some live milkweed seedlings. So um, I'm going to check out some of these questions and see which ones I can avoid because I don't know the answers. Looks like Judy Dewar is saying that there's a community park, Kimball and Telephone. Judy, I'd love to help out with that. You should just hit me up. Um, I'm going to type my answer. Also, a lot of people are asking about recordings of this webinar. It is being recorded and it will be posted on the SAMO Fund YouTube page, um, which I can put that in the chat again. Hey, you guys, I'm here um, at my computer. I've been watching. Can you hear me? Oh, nice. Woohoo! Are, so, are you in? Yeah, what's up, Noe? Hey, guys. Hi. Um, do you want? <laughs> Welcome. Thank you. You know, this is the first time I've ever used Zoom. And hey, so, can you see me? Negative. Negative. So, how do I do that? Oh. I just pressed ask to start video. It should be bottom left. Um, I've got a button to click. Ah, there, I am. <laughs> there she is. Hey, hey. What's up, Noe? I'm just, I'm here. Yeah. <laughs> I've been watching the whole thing. It's awesome, you guys. Right look, on. That's great. I'm just trying to adjust my screen so you've got a nice background with some milkweed, milkweed. seeds. <laughs> 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 Nothing like the sound of shaking milkweed. It sounds like a maraca. I love it. Yeah. And then I wanted to show you, Izzy, one of the seeds that we planted is already coming up for the Areocarpa. So That's cute. awesome. Oh, it's adorable. <laughs> so good to so, hear. I brought it in. Yep. I planted the milkweeds that you gave us. They're doing really well. <laughs> good, good, good. Ah. Izzy, can you put the poll up? I think we'll just ask. Uh, I'm going to make another poll in Zoom right now, but if you could just ask folks where they're coming from again, I think that's just poll number one, yeah? Relaunching it. Love it. Okay, it should be up now if we want to recount of where everyone's from. You guys don't have Santa Barbara County on here. No, we have yeah, and beyond. That's and beyond. That's 
that's embarrassing because I'm like 20 miles from Santa Barbara County. <laughs> <laughs> you could have put, you should have put um, Michigan and then I could be the one, <laughs> the one person voting that. <laughs> I know we're going to wait just a few minutes um, to start with you, Noe. Um, do you have any basic tips for folks who are trying to grow some of the harder milkweed? I know we'll cover Asclepias fascicularis, the more common one. Yeah. I, um, well, I think the first thing, so the area carpa, I've had the opportunity to, to, to work with because it's something that I, I know where there's some stands and I've been able to collect some seed. Um, and my main difficulty with it is just to get the plants big in their pots. You know, I, I don't have much trouble with seed germination. I use outdoor nursery techniques. So just mimicking natural environments. But then it's hard to get them to really grow. And I find that the best thing I can do is just get them in the ground as soon as possible. Um, once the seeds have germinated and they've got their second or third set of true leaves, I just try to get them in the ground. And then it still takes two or three years for them to really develop uh, enough to make flowers. And I still haven't gotten seeds from plants I have in the ground. The Californica is a whole nother thing. Um, one time somebody gifted me a few seeds and I was able to germinate them and then they kind of languished. I got a couple plants in the ground, they're hanging in there, but um, it's tricky. Maybe you, maybe you'll hook me up with a few seeds, uh, Antonio. Yeah, we, we, we should have enough this year. So um, we can definitely pass them your way if we have enough. It's, um, I think that one, what we're finding a little bit, Noe is, um, I think those stands get they're like me <laughs> those stands get big or get small depending on well for me it's the seasons right thanksgiving i bring i might as well bust out a whole other set of pants for thanksgiving <laughs> and christmas and then come around now i i'm starting to shrink a little bit put those pants away this is way too much personal information but what i think <laughs> we're seeing <laughs> with the californica and the Carpa, i'm starting to see you know I, I i don't know how good a grower you are noe but i'm assuming that you're probably very, very good. And I think most growers or folks who've been doing propagation and uh, different types of growing, we see patterns year after year, or we see patterns like crop after crop. And the pattern that we're starting to notice, or at least I'm starting to notice just from talking with people and dealing with them more over the last few years, is that area carpa and California seem to respond more to water, to, to, to annual rainfall, mm -hmm. than the fasciculares. And fascicularis tends to, from what I'm seeing, uh, more disturbance. Um, so it's more roadside. And so if there's more roadside stuff going on or fires, I think that would be, it seems like it's coming up more. But area carpet and California stands that we heard about last year, some people are saying this year was the smallest they've seen it or vice versa, which is really weird. They're saying that this year is the biggest stand that they've ever seen or that they've seen in years, which it could be in response to. Maybe there weren't a lot of annual weeds. Um, our hills look really clean right now. There's usually a lot of weeds and no one, well, at least where I'm looking at, very few people have gone to spray and to cut down the weeds. It's just been so dry that there was a very little chance for these annual weeds to come up. And so maybe the area carpa and the Californica are responding to less weed competition and expanding this year. So I, I, that's what I'm seeing. So anyways, I... The stands of the area carpa that, you know, we can actually see some along the roadsides where we drive around here in the San Ynez Valley. They're beautiful, big, blooming this year. So even with the, we got less than seven inches, well, about seven inches of rain, which is half our normal. Um, there's some big stands. They look good. So. Yeah. Everywhere's and the rain. Yeah. And the rain thing's so weird, right? No, I, I mean, to me, it is because you hear the number and it's like, whoa, that's nothing. 
but then there's places where when it rains seven inches, like all the water goes to that spot. So the seven uh -huh. inch mark is it's just an average, right? It right. just means like that the that the hillsides got very little and it washed away, but it still means that where the water accumulates, it's still accumulated just less. So it's mm -hmm. it's fascinating. Like that's why I love working. Part of why I love working with native plants because there's compared to like an early girl tomato, right? There's, they know everything about an early girl. There's just no mystery to an early girl tomato. And there's so much mystery to the native plants, right? To, and to open pollinated seed. There's just so much that we don't know. And that's why I think it's, it's so like fascinating to, to learn about all this stuff. Cool. So it is uh, a little bit afternoon and we have a packed afternoon. So I think we should go ahead and get started. How are you feeling, Izzy? Good. So um, for the first part of Noe's section, uh, we have a video that's uh, showing some, um, some of what she has to say on creating your own sustainable backyard milkweed nursery. So I will be Before, sharing that. Be, oh. Izzy, really quick, let me introduce and just welcome everybody back, yeah? Sorry about that. Um, <laughs> You're good. So, every, <laughs> so everybody, welcome back from your 18 minute lunch. <laughs> um, maybe you guys never left. Um, now you know what it's like to work in the field. We just, we walk and eat at the same time while we're going to a milkweed patch. Um, but thank you guys for, for joining us again. I want to uh, welcome in our next speaker, Noe Turk. She's from Yes Yes Hi. Nursery, which is a certified organic nursery in Santa Barbara County that was established in 2006. They grow plants for local natives. Uh, culinary and medicinal herbs and garden vegetables. Yes, yes, nurseries, native plants, including narrow leaf milkweed are grown from seeds collected from plants in cultivation on their own farm so that they can maintain genetic diversity in people's gardens and beyond. So welcome Noe. And Thank it you. sounds like uh, Izzy, you gotta, you, you're gonna take it away. Yep, so I will be sharing um, this video. I'd like to give a huge shout out to Leslie and Ashley for making it and doing a great job. So. Um, let's see, and please let me know if you can't see it or if the sound isn't working. Okay. Hi everybody, I'd like to introduce myself. My name is Noe Turk and my nursery is called Yes Yes Nursery. We're a certified organic small scale nursery in the San Ynez Valley and we grow um, native plants, um, culinary and medicinal herbs, and a few garden and vegetables. Um, what I'd like to do with you today is walk you through some of the simple steps to setting up your own backyard nursery so that you can grow native plants, particularly the, our native milkweed, and um, have all the tools that you need in order to uh, begin that process and, and be able to spread the milkweed out into the world as far as it needs to go. So I hope you stay with me and um, thank you for being here. All right, so we hydrated this coir, which again is the, um, it's the outer shell of the coconut and um, it's a waste product from the coconut industry. It's a renewable resource. And again, we use the coir as a replacement for peat moss in our soil mix. Um, there's other things that you can use if you don't have access to the cocoa coir. You can use uh, composted leaf mulch from the bottom of a compost pile and again run it through a screen. The main thing that you want is something that is um, fluffy, that contains organic matter and humus and um, that's going to form the base for your soil mix. So when you're making soil mix, it's just like cooking. It's a basic recipe. And usually uh, the ingredients are listed in parts. In this case, my part is a five gallon bucket. Um, and so what I'm going to do is um, basically three parts of coir. So I'm going to do one and a half buckets. Our part is going to be a half a bucket. So I'm going to add a little more, another half a bucket, and then the second ingredient, you're going to want to add nutrients and plant nutrients. I group them into two categories. One of the categories I like to think of as um, 
vitamins and minerals. And the other category I sort of think of as um, like caloric value. And the calories are really like the nitrogen, potassium, and phosphorus. And then the vitamins and minerals are your micronutrients like magnesium, calcium, zinc, and things that plants just need in trace amounts. Um, the other important ingredient that you add in small quantities is you want something lively that has a biological activity. So my nutrients, I use, um, you know, some, some kelp, a little bit of um, feather meal, and then for the biology to make it lively, we use worm castings. Um, you can use a good aged compost, anything, anything that's got some life to it. And then you're gonna mix with a shovel. So we're mixing the nutrients in. Like so, and then the other things that you wanna have in a good soil mix is you need structure. So you don't want it to collapse and so you need some to build some structure. So I like to think of it as having something chunky. And for us, we, um, we use lava rock. Um, perlite would be a possible thing or any kind of like a sharp gravel. So you want something chunky and that's gonna create structure. And then you want something gritty. So a little bit of coarse sand. Um, you don't want to use beach sand because it has salt in it and it's not really coarse enough. So again, we've added our ingredients and we're going to mix it. And there you have a soil mix that you made yourself at home. This is Asclepius areocarpa, the Indian milkweed. And I'm going to show you my very high-tech seed planter, which is simply a piece of cardstock that I bend into a V. And you pour the seeds into the cardstock, and you use your sharp pencil. You push the seeds out one, two. I'm going to plant four seeds per pot. 50% germination would be would be good, might be more, might be less. So there, I planted uh, 100 seeds in a pretty short amount of time. And I'm just going to cover them with a little bit of soil mix, shoop, 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 like so. So I would say, you know, this would be maybe less than a quarter inch of soil over the seeds. And you just want to be sure that you tamp them down so that there's good contact with the soil and the seed. And then, very importantly, um, you're going to label what you've done. You want to keep some soil with the root, but I'm going to individuate them out of their pots where I planted four seeds in each pot um, expecting about 50% germination sometimes more sometimes less but we're gonna give them each their own space now and let them size up a little bit before uh, planting them out into the landscape and now some people might wonder well if there's two plants that are super close together should I separate them and I would say no, I don't think they're going to fight with each other and it's just easier to leave them as a little duo. So maybe you have a pot where none of the seeds germinated. Um, if you dump that out into there and then you take this soil and you throw it on the ground somewhere that you think the milkweed would want to grow, those ungerminated seeds are often, many of them are just dormant and they have a delayed germination. So they'll come up in a year or maybe in two years, they might wait for the conditions to be perfect. 
Um, so just keep in mind where you throw out that old soil mix that you put it somewhere where those seeds will be able to uh, flourish in their own time. Milkweed is such a summer party for so many different invertebrate species. Um, there will be tarantula wasps and milkweed bugs and milkweed beetles and all the different butterflies will nectar on the plant and so will honeybees and other native bees. When most of our other flowers have kind of stopped blooming and there's things are starting to dry up, the milkweed comes into its glory and it really is serving uh, so many insects and so much wildlife. So even regardless of the monarchs, it's a really important plant to grow. One of the most important things that you're going to do for your backyard nursery is you're going to build some kind of a, a space that will protect your seedlings. The most important things to consider are that you create a little bit of shade. I use shade cloth um, between 30 and 50 percent shade. And so then the next thing that you want to think about in addition to shade is that you want to have your seedlings on tables where you can um, wrap the legs with a sticky um, barrier to insects or you can put them in buckets of water to keep the bugs from crawling up the table. A simple shade structure like this is really easy and inexpensive to build and you can build it to any dimension. Um, the basic process is to pound rebar into the ground in four foot intervals and then you take a piece of PVC pipe and you put it over the rebar to form the hoops. You've got, you've got your rebar, you have the PVC over the rebar and then we use old drip tape from our farm to form the cover, to hold the shade cloth down and you've built a really simple easy to maintain structure that you can have in your backyard um, and and it is really all you need for growing native plants we're not looking to change the environment and um, it's not necessary to have heat mats or um, any kind of special technology you're really just creating a protected space for your seedlings if you don't want to build a shade house even a small one um, their next best thing is just to take a table and put it outside and you can mimic that covered wagon style by attaching some hoops and draping a piece of shade cloth over the hoops and there you have your little mini shade house covered wagon style and it's something that anybody can build in their backyard so you've grown your milkweed and these are acceptable size plant for planting in the ground. You're ready to plant. What are your first main considerations? I think one of the most important things to consider is that um, milkweed, in order to produce viable seed, it needs to have multiple plants that are all uh, genetically dif different from each other so that they can cross pollinate. So your goal is to have more milkweed in the world, millions of milkweed plants, you need seed. Um, so planting a group of three is sort of a minimum cluster. You know, you're just gonna dig a little hole. One, two, three. I'm planting them about uh, two feet apart. So again, you just place your hand over the pot and you can see beautiful roots and we're gonna tuck it in there you go one two and you want to make sure that uh, you cover the native soil over your potting soil so that there's a complete coverage and just staying pretty much at the level of the stem of the plant. So there's your little milkweed patch. How are you going to water it? So I have a very good system. It is this funky old bucket. I drilled a tiny hole. 
I used my smallest drill bit and drilled a tiny hole near the base of the bucket. So I'm going to just set it in place. And you can see the water's coming out pretty slow. Um, you can deliver five gallons of water to a plant and it's a lot better to deliver that water slowly. If you take a five gallon bucket of water and you dump it out on the plant, it's gonna spread on the surface. If you deliver it slowly, it's gonna soak in. Thank you all for staying with us and, and listening to, to my talk and I hope that it was meaningful for you. Um, yeah, I wanna point out that we're here in this beautiful milkweed patch that I planted and I haven't seen any monarch butterflies yet this year. So, um, so that's why we're doing this. I, I do think it's going to take a group of concerned people working independently and in groups to, um, to really make the change that we need to see in order to keep the monarch population alive. And so I appreciate your time and your dedication and I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have. Okay, so thank you for that, Noe. Done with that. Yeah, thank you. It came out great. Thank you. That Ashley, Leslie, that was amazing. You guys killed it. Izzy, thank you. <laughs> this is probably, I mean, all of our speakers have been amazing, but I think people want to know. So let's just let it loose. Um, can, I, can I send it over to you, at Izzy, for the first question? Yes, let me take a look at the Q&A real quick. Um, um I, let me let me throw one question out there real quick that people might have uh noe how long does it take from when you plant a seed to when you expect to put it out in the field or in the ground a seed in a in a pot or a, or a little nursery tray right what's the timeline it it depends a lot on on when you plant the seed so a very i i did two plantings this year one in um February and another one in March, and the seeds all came up at the same time. So, you know, there is a certain natural timing for the seed. I didn't do any pre-treatment on the seed. I was just using a natural outdoor nursery technique. So um, I think the plants that I was putting in the ground there were from a March sowing. So March, April, three months to uh, from seed to, to transplant for a small plant. Um, but it can vary. If you plant your seeds in February, we'll, you'll have a different result than if you plant them in March or April. Um, those seeds that I planted for that particular, the Areocarpus seeds, I don't know if you guys can see this, but that was 522 and we got a first germination on a little Asclepius Areocarpa um, just the other day. So that's pretty fast, uh, just a couple weeks. Um, so someone is asking, um, what types of materials do you like to use for the shade cloth for the structure in your nursery? Um, because our shade structure is pretty big, we got a, a custom made shade cloth with grommets on the edges so that it's sturdy. Um, between 30 and 50% shade is good. And then whether it's a woven or a mesh, it's, it's really up to you. Um, I would just shop around online and see what kind of things are available um, to meet your size specifications. But 30 to 50% shade is kind of an ideal. Mm -hmm. Noe, can you go over the recipe for your seed mix again? Your soil mix? Yeah, so, um, so what I use is, um, I use, and, and, and maybe it's easier if I can, after my talk, I can write it out in the um, chat forum. Is that a good? I, I think so, Noe. And you know, we have to promote, <laughs> your Instagram page is amazing. Oh, thank you. How many, how many, <laughs> how many times have I, has my wife asked me to do something and I don't because I'm on your Instagram page. Oh, no. <laughs> 
I'm reading you. Get back and out there. The, I know. The details that you provide mm. are intense. And, you know, I've been around native plant growing um, a long time and no one gives out detailed information like you are. Um, it's just not usually have to charge for it or people don't give it out at all because it's a secret. So, yeah, so, I I, just, so thank you for that. And I'm self-taught in the work that I do and for the most part, and it's only been through other people's genuine, like generous sharing that, you know, I've been able to glean some information. And I do find that some people in the nursery industry are secretive and, um, so I don't want to be like that. So I will post on, I'll post the recipe on the, um, in the chat forum and I'll put more detail up um, on my Instagram later, probably tomorrow. But it's basically, it's three parts square, one part lava rock, half part sand, and then adding the, the micronutrients. Beautiful. And yeah, so you guys all know if you're on Instagram, it's yes, yes, nursery is her Instagram page. Thank you. Izzy? Okay, so um, yes, another question. Um, Eli is asking, I planted a good sized showy root with a good soil in a hole that was mostly clay, about 12 to 18 inches down. Do you think that will hinder its growth or will the roots grow through the clay? Um, I find, so where, where we farm, we have mostly clay soil and, and some of it's, it's not just clay soil, it's clay. Um, you can build houses with it. Um, and I find that the, the narrow leaf milkweed does great. And it's even, we have a big stand growing in a place that gets seasonally flooded. So there's standing water during the winter rains while the plant is dormant. And then it's blasting hot sun in the summer. Um, and I give it a little supplemental water, but not much. So I think the clay is fine with the Asclepias aerocarpa. You would want maybe to have um, the plant raised up a little bit. So it's not going to be in a puddle of standing water in the winter. But a lot of our soil here is clay and the native plants are really well adapted to it. The people are asking um, where they can see the video. And yes, we'll put it up on our YouTube page um, after the conference. It might take a few days, but it'll be on Samo Fund YouTube page. Um, Noe, can you talk to folks wanting to do this in like a little balcony or an apartment, like in small pots? Would they, um, would the, the process or would the soil be different? You can totally do this on as small of a scale as you want. Um, I think indoors inside an apartment would be difficult, but if you have a patio that's partly sunny, um, you can just set up a little table and, um, you know, again, provide some shade. Maybe you can just put the table in a place that gets dappled light from a tree. And if you don't have the time or the space to make your own soil mix, you can buy a good quality potting mix. Um, from your local nursery and just start planting seeds. It's really easy to find a few little pots and just empower yourself to do it. You understand that it's going to be a learning curve and you're going to have different successes and failures. Um, keep notes is really important. So write down everything that you do so that in the following year, you you can look back at that and see what worked and what didn't work. But go for it, you guys. You can do it. Um, Erica is asking, do you remove the seeds from the silk or plant them with the little fluff that comes with the seeds? So, so my technique for gathering seeds is to harvest the seed pods just before they crack open. Um, where we are, we have a lot of the red milkweed bugs and the red milkweed bug um, eats the seeds. And so once the seed pods crack open, if you have a lot of these bugs, they're gonna um, chew into the seed and eat it and it won't be viable. So I harvest the pods just before they crack open on their own. And then I put them in a paper bag and let them dry and fluff up. And then I do, I clean the seed um, and store it in a little paper packet until the right timing for planting. So, But there's no harm in leaving the fuzz on. Um, I don't see why that would be a problem. 
we're going to talk a little bit more about irrigation practices um, in the next, uh, the next talk about kind of designing with, with milkweeds. But what's your experience in the farm um, and then growing them in the ground in landscapes, um, Noe, as far as watering them, watering milkweeds during the summer? Because, you know, as, as a horticulturists or gardeners, a lot of times we'll recommend people try not to water their, their natives, their native plants during summer. And so what's your experience? So if you're getting plants established and you're like this, you know, like those milkweed plants that I planted, um, that was a couple of weeks ago, I haven't actually watered them again and I just checked on them and they're doing fine. But, um, but the basic guideline is that when you plant the plant, it's, been in a little pot and that's where the roots are so it's expecting some extra water while your well, the roots are growing and connecting with the soil so um i think a schedule where a newly established plant gets watered after uh, two or three days and then after a week and then gradually tapering off and then really just observing the plant and if it needs if it's asking for water go ahead and give it some, uh, you don't wanna make them suffer too much. And of course, plants in pots, you do, you need to water them regularly. They don't have access to those deep reservoirs of moisture in the soil. So regular water is, uh, is necessary. Um, so about the pots, um, we have some more questions about those. So Marilyn is asking, if um, we can't plant the milkweed in the ground, how often would you recommend we change the size of the pot that it's in? Or does it need to be changed? For the narrow leaf milkweed, um, I would recommend to gradually move it up into about a two gallon size container for one plant or, um, or a five gallon if you want to interplant as one of the earlier speakers. Um, was talking about interplanting some other um, pollinator friendly plants in the same pot. So a little bigger would be fine. And then what I would do is, um, and, and that should be fine for this season. Um, once the milkweed goes dormant in the winter and, and just before it starts to emerge in the spring, you can turn the pot out, shake that old soil mix off and refresh the soil that's in the pot and do that once a year or every other year if you wanna supplement uh, some fertilizer instead. Mm -hmm. Noe, can you cover uh, a little bit more in depth uh, how you find out if the seed is ready for harvest? So, uh, yeah, and I'll, I'll do, I can do more um, discussion on this, but um, the main thing is that I look at the plants when some of the milkweed pods have started to open. I know that there's ones that are going to be following, and so I actually do um, I monitor the milkweed patch because it's here at the farm. I monitor it during its seed production pretty much every day and just clip with a little sharp scissors those pods that are just starting to crack open right before they, right before they break open. And that way I don't have to go through the thing of bagging the um, pods on the plant. And it also keeps those little red bugs from chewing the seeds. So um, it's really part of the thing of having citizen, you know, core of, of milkweed farmers, you have your own little patch. And again, it's going to be multiple plants so that they get cross pollination to maintain the genetic diversity and the viability of the seed. But um, just having that milkweed patch right there on your patio or in your backyard allows you to really monitor it carefully and have a, uh, be there right at the perfect moment to catch those seeds. Um, and maybe one more question. Um, Sam is asking, is it advisable to water milkweeds in the summer and how often specifically in the coastal zone? Uh, once you have plants established, I really don't think they need water. They're growing out there in the wild on their own. But again, when you're establishing a plant, you need to have a regimen where you water every few days and then gradually backing off to once a week or every other week. Uh, milkweed is pretty tolerant of, of summer water. It's Some native plants resent getting extra water and the milkweed is fine. So if you want to water it, that's totally fine. You could use a little gray water. Um, 
from your kitchen in that five gallon bucket with the hole drilled in it and just let it get a little drip once a week or every other week should be fine. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. So the time always goes by too fast <laughs> uh, when we're talking how to grow native plants. Um, no, if you have time, there are a few questions in the Q&A and folks are asking stuff through chat. Um, only if you, if you have time, there's, there's some folks that we didn't get a chance to answer some of their questions. Um, in the next panel, we'll cover maybe a few of those topics. But is there anything you want to leave us with right now, Noe, as far as growing our own seed or making our own backyard nursery sustainably? I just want everybody to really feel empowered that it's just something that they can do and, and, and not wait for the government or the Home Depot or anybody else to, to, to do all this work for us. And that each person playing a little part is going to have uh, just a huge effect. And, and especially in a drought year, a small little native garden can provide really significant habitat for all of the pollinators that are out there. They're hungry, they're looking for food for their next generation. And um, so just feel empowered and, and take the steps and, and go for it. And I'm, I'm really happy to continue to be a resource for people. Um, we have a website, yesyesnursery.com. And you can contact me through that. Um, we're super small scale and we're just in the San Ynez Valley. We don't ship plants. So, um, so for people who are outside of our range, you know, I'm just here to help um, empower you to do, to do this work. Go for it. Yeah. Everybody, uh, I believe that Noe and people like her are blessings in Central and Southern California. Um, I'm so I'm so thankful that you joined us. You know, <laughs> it's so cool that we got to connect. We'll put yeah. the video up um, on YouTube in a few days, so you guys can follow step by step how to make your own um, sustainable soil. Um, you have her Instagram, Yes Yes Nursery. She delivers to Santa Barbara and Ojai through her nursery. So thank you guys so much. Thank you, Noe, so much. Yeah, thank you all. Yeah, yeah take care. Mm -hmm. Hey, so this is just, I don't know who organized this conference. Was it us, Izzy, Leslie, Ashley, was it us? Who scheduled like 18 talks on top of each other? <laughs> we don't, it's like really good food, but we don't get a chance to like, just sit back and go, that was good. That was a very good, like we have like eight different amazing tacos, but we're just, the, the taste of the last taco is still here. Anyways, you can tell I haven't had lunch. So before I get too hungry, um oh this is going to be a cool panel i'm excited to bring on dr nicole calhoun she's not like graduated as a doctor but she is like a plant doctor she's a good friend she is co-founder and co-owner of artemisia nursery nursery in northeast la uh she's the bass player for an amazing band called sage against the machine um and dr evan meyer who is almost a research doctor, but he is the, um, he, <laughs> he's, he's the amazing vocalist and pianist for the same band, but he's executive director now for Theodore Payne Foundation, which, correct me if I'm wrong, Evan, Theodore Payne Foundation is the oldest still running native plant nursery in California? Um, if, you, if you take the time that Theodore Payne himself started the, the, his business, which was in 1902, then yeah, I would say so. We've been around since 1960. So, you know, like California Botanic Garden might be in the running on that too, but um, we've been around for a while. Yeah, Theodore Payne, the man came in the early 1900s and started selling native plants back then. I love it. How are you doing, Nicole? Doing great. How are you guys? It's good. This is just like, like band practice. We're just hanging out, <laughs> except there's, 463 people watching. I can't believe we've <laughs> kept it this many people. It's amazing. So I asked Nicole and Evan to join me on this panel to talk about design ideas and where to put native milkweed in your garden, how to use it, what type of irrigation techniques you might use, what plants it grows around, lots of different things. So we have some general ideas that we want to talk about. And we're looking for folks to give us 
uh, through the chat and Q and A questions about, you know, I tried to grow it here and it died. Um, I, I have a whole front lawn in Pasadena, where should I put it? Or, you know, I remove a lawn. So Izzy, if you could do us a favor and monitor those, uh, those topics. But I just wanna start off with this picture I took the other day um, in one of our gardens, our public gardens, here at the, the Santa Monica Mountains National Recreation Area. This is at King Gillette Ranch. King Gillette Ranch is, is in Calabasas. It's hot. It'll be 105 degrees there, you know, uh, some days during the summer. And a friend of ours, a coworker, planted, I think he said about five or 10 plants of milkweed about two or three years ago. And those plants, from what I remember him saying, aren't there anymore, but they've bounced around. And one of the places that they bounced around is right by these irrigation, these valve boxes. And I don't know if this means that they're leaking or because they do like water sometimes, or they, they, they love extra water. Um, or if they're just finding these little corners that we'll find, sometimes when concrete meets, meets the dirt, right? The concrete ends, the sidewalk ends, and the dirt begins, there's little dips and there's little divots. And those are perfect places for water to gather, for seed to hang on. If you guys have ever driven in the desert, you know, past Riverside, going out to Phoenix, you'll see that five, 10 feet away from the I-10 is lush. It's so dang lush. And then you look 30 feet away and it's dry. The same exact plants are in two different conditions, right? The, the road will attract water. There's a river sometimes by the road. When it rains, it kind of washes off the road. And so all these little micro habitats and microclimates in gardens, I think are super important for when we're thinking about where we're going to put milkweed. So I wanted to- photo, to, Tonio, we can't see it yet. Yeah, the, the uh, people are clamoring for this photo. Oh, you can't, oh, can you not they see it? They couldn't see it, yeah, the chat oh, is like, let me see. where's the photo, come on. Let's see, <laughs> where is my- Everyone's <laughs> super excited for this photo. <laughs> it, it's a bad, it's not even a good photo. Can you see? Oh yeah, yep. Oh yep, <laughs> coming right up on the irrigation boxes. Yep. Um, there we go. Can yeah, I so say this, something just to right. like frame, frame some quick thoughts on this? Because I've been sure. thinking about this this morning. So first off, I want to like plug a book. It was kind of a cool book, Planting in a Post-Wild World. Um, and so we're talking about design, right? Like for me, I think my take on this is that milkweeds are definitely best. The native milkweeds are definitely best in a naturalistic kind of planting, like a meadow planting or the kind of type of plantings that are kind of becoming like the new modern style, which is um, like sometimes they call it the new perennial style that Pete Udoff has made famous um, or the new American garden style. Um, and that's where I think they really work. So I think we could maybe explore that a little bit, um, like those mixed perennial meadow gardens, which to me are so much more beautiful than a more formal garden. And I don't really, I don't, I can't imagine, I've never seen this, but I can't really imagine our native milkweeds in a super formal layout. I'm curious if you guys have ever seen that or think that would work. I've yet to see it. I would love to see someone try. <laughs> yeah, and I would, uh, I, I would agree with Evan. If you plant an oak tree, <laughs> You don't really want that oak tree jumping around your garden. You don't want it to be like, oh, it's going to provide shade for my house during the summer. Cool. And you don't want it to end up like in your backyard. Um, same thing with like a Cianothis or a Manzanita or something that you want five by five for full color right in front of your house during the summer. But milkweed, I, it, 100%, Evan, it's, um, it's going to be happy where it's going to be happy. You might, uh, our goal, one of our goals here is to hopefully avoid you losing too many plants but they do tend to like, almost like California fuchsia, they tend to get established and then kind of start to wander around the nursery, which makes them not the most convenient for like a White House, <laughs> Washington DC type lawn, right? For sure. Yeah, and I think, I think that's what you're seeing here with the irrigation boxes. And there are ways of designing a garden to embrace that. And um, Nicole and Antonio, you've seen my yard and I, I let it go. I let it ramble. And I'm all, I, I think like, to me, that's the most interesting looking. You kind of get the most bang for your buck in terms of supporting wildlife. And it's also to me, the most like interesting thing to garden in because you're seeing, you're, you're like reacting to it. You're not just, you're not just establishing it and kind of like dominating your space. You're letting your space be in dialogue with you. And, and like, you're like, yes. oh, look at that. 
there's a little seedling there. I'm going to let that one grow. Or like, you know, this, this seedling here is not quite the right place. I'm going to pull that one out. And so it's much more of a, like an interaction versus like, you're just imposing something. And I think that's the way that you should probably think about gardening with these plants is, is like, you, they're going to tell you what, what they want more so than you're going to tell them probably. Yes. So I'm going to cover two real quick topics and then Nicole, I'm going to let you freestyle. Um, we always, Theodore Payne, I'm sure it says it, Artemisia Nursery says it, that the best time to plant, the ideal time to plant is November to March or somewhere in that area, right? What we call the rainy season or the cool season. <laughs> Throw that out the window for what we're talking about now, which is milkweed. And it's kind of weird because people are like, oh, I got to plant November, March. So throw it out the window. And the other thing I'd like to emphasize is that if you can afford it, which is why accessibility is so important. If you can afford it, try to get more than two plants, more than three plants. We want to establish colonies of these plants, especially if you have monarchs around, they'll, they'll decimate one plant. So ideally you'll buy small pots, you'll plant March, April, May, and you'll be planting groups of threes, fives, sevens, right? So Nicole? Yeah, so um, over here in Northeast LA, a lot of folks in our community uh, have been lucky enough to take advantage of the DWP turf replacement rebate. Uh, that's our local water district. And um, one of the things they've been emphasizing besides using California friendly plants or mostly California native plants is to incorporate rainwater capture um, including like rain gardens. So like a shallow basin in your soil where water collects and that ties right back into what Antonio was describing about seeing the milkweed popping up in these places where water tends to collect. Um, milkweed's a great, great plant. If you're, if you're lucky enough to take advantage of this rebate, um, get, get some milkweed in your rain garden. Um, even if you're not doing the rebate, think about like ways that you can be collecting rainwater in your garden just by subtly shifting the topography of the soil and uh, look at those low-lying places as, as home for milkweed. Um, but then as we we're talking about, you know, it's dormant half the year, it's getting munched on by caterpillars half the year, um, it's maybe like wandering around the yard. And so, you know, if we only have milkweed there, aesthetically, maybe that's not fulfilling all of our garden fantasies. And then also as far as our monarchs, they, they need nectar year round. So um, we want to also incorporate plants that are providing beautiful blooms aesthetically and providing forage for the monarchs. So I think that's something the three of us could all talk to you is like combinations of plants. I really like to nestle the milkweed, the groupings of milkweed in between um, plants that are going to provide more year round structure and bloom. Um, so I don't know if you guys want to start throwing down some favorites for that, especially for like maybe beginning gardeners, plants that are a little easier. Um, I'll throw down one right away. That's just like, a giver right off, right out the gate is in Celia Californica. They grow so fast. If you're starting with a blank slate, you don't know what to do, and you want to provide habitat, throw some in Celia Californica in there. It's going to grow to like four feet in the first year. It's going to be covered in flowers for months on end, uh, provide habitat not only for, for monarchs, but lots of other insects and songbirds as well when it goes to seed. Um, so that's a really fun one to, you know, get in the mix yeah. of weeds. I agree with that one. And also that's one that can tend to like spread around a little bit too. So if you're creating that like ecosystem garden where you're letting things move and speak to you, that's a great choice in Celia Californica. I'm going to throw out yarrow. If you're yeah. particularly if you're going for like a meadow type planting, um, because it can take a little extra water. If you want to kind of push your milkweed with water, you can do that. Um, the other thing that just, I don't think we've gotten to, and I'm, I'm sorry, it's my daughter's fifth birthday, so it's very hectic here. So I missed the, oh, uh, hey, the morning. Evan, is, she, is Violet there? She's somewhere. She's running around with her friend. Dude, we're getting ready for 15 kids to show up at her house. Dude, little, you got to call her. It's it's so <laughs> cool that you took time out of it. We, let's sing happy birthday to her real quick. Whenever, <laughs> we, we, have 400 yeah, we have 450 to. people to sing happy birthday. 100%. Um, we got to. Yeah. But the other thing I would just, I'm sure someone's already mentioned this, but they're kind of slow like you kind of have to get them through some time. They don't like milkweeds themselves. They're not just going to be like blooming right off the bat. In my experiences, you, you kind of have to like get some time for them to establish and become a full plant. Um, so, so that's part of something to incorporate into like design ideas is that it's, you know, you, you got to be ready to, to kind of 
wait a year or two for it to, to grow to, to the size, to full size and to flower as well. Yeah. And think of it too. You're not just cultivating the top of the plant. You're really cultivating like that root system that's going to come back for you each year. So there's a lot of, a lot of action going on under the ground that we're not seeing. And you have to have a little faith in that as a gardener. Yeah, I agree. So there's this, um, it, most native plants like Encilia Californica, the one you guys just mentioned, yarrow, those are fast. Those are almost like weeds. And yeah. then there's a small group of native plants that were like, they're going to take a few years to get established. I think the most common one is Matilla hot poppy that people are like, you plant it, you know, handle the roots gently, delicately, you plant it. It might not do anything for a year or two, but once it takes hold, watch out. That thing is, is gone. Oh, and I think <laughs> it's aggressive. Think it's, yeah. Because of, um, dude, it's more aggressive than my cousin on payday at a bar, doing a singles bar. That thing is aggressive. <laughs> <laughs> but not, my cousin aside, um, so, you know, we see patterns as horticulturists and uh, Romnia, which is metal poppy. I see the same thing with hummingbird sage when people plant hummingbird sage. And so Romnia, let, let me go back to metal poppy. Metal poppy grows underground. It spreads underground. It wants to create this colony. Uh, hummingbird sage does the same thing. It wants to grow underground and spread and create this colony. And people want flowers the first year on hummingbird sage. And I always tell them, cut back the first or second round of flowers you see because what that does is it pushes the plant down it signals not time to have babies yet let's keep growing sideways and you'd be amazed at how quickly you can get a full colony of, of hummingbird sage by just sacrificing that first year of flowers and the same thing with milkweed i'm not telling you to cut your milkweed down your first year it probably won't even flower the first year but what you're seeing the first year sometimes the second is underground growth that you can't see unless you have like amazing like x-men glasses to see through the ground you see there's a bunch of roots getting established once year two or three come out it has a strong foundation and those things take off so yes being patient with with narrow leaf milkweed is super important um that that thing about like cutting your plan that's something that i think separates like uh, a really experienced gardener and someone who's just starting out is when you're just starting out and you're growing a plant and you've like put all this love into it. Oh, every leaf is precious. Every leaf is precious. And then like some like, you know, you know, old jaded gardener, like, like maybe like some of us um, comes and just rips the top off it and like, all right, I fixed it for you. And you're like, what? <laughs> <laughs> or they come in and they, they coppice it, they cut it to the ground. You're like, what are you doing? That was my plan. It's so beautiful. But that's really how you get that super nice lush look is you guys remember that that hummingbird sage incident at my old apartment right i had this beautiful hummingbird oh. sage and i was like nurturing it and uh the landlord brought in you know mo and blow crew and they they just like decimated it took it all the way down like you couldn't see anything left of it i was just like oh my baby and <laughs> it, it totally sprouted back like 10 times fuller than it was before and i was like oh what a miracle it made it through that you know and then like three months later, Mo and Blue Crew comes back and I'm like trying to tell them like, don't, don't take this one out. But sure enough, it just got like decimated again, like all the way to the ground. And then it's like 10 times bigger when it comes back. It was really amazing. So, um, yeah, yeah you but know. you know, as long as it, as many years as you've been in doing this business, like it can still be scary. Like we have a, um, a Panamint Daisy at, at Theodore Payne and it's, it's a really rare Daisy and Ciliopsis covilii. Um, it's the emblem of the California Native Plant Society. And we've got like six of them in pots. And so they're like precious to us. And, and Tim Becker and I always go and look at them and he's our director of horticulture. And there's like a bunch of buds on the base of them. And there's like the top has leaves. And we're like, normally you'd be like, all right, cool. You can just cut the top off and let the base sprout out and get, and the plant will get bigger. And with that one, we're like, every time we go look at it, we're like, should we cut the top off? I don't know. Like, this is so rare. We're going to kill it. So, you know, even if you're, even if you're experienced, there's always something to learn. And, and it is like kind of scary to just cut a plant back like that, but, but it's a good thing to do for many of them. I yeah. don't think it's a good thing to do for milkweed though, unless I'm wrong. Do you... Oh yeah. I don't, I wouldn't recommend that. I was just saying how it's, it grows by rhizome and a lot of the, the action people were commenting earlier that I've had a milkweed in for almost two years. It hasn't flowered. Um, it's not, you know, it's not growing or it's basically that was it. Um, and I think a lot of the problem is that you, it's working. It's doing its thing. It's just underground. We can't see it. I wanted to comment on um, the idea of using milkweed in a more, I don't know what the word is, naturalistic, wild uh, landscape. Um, you guys remember the super blooms from a few years ago? 
those were all, or most of them are annuals. So it rains, they bloom, and they're great. But, and the LA Times covers them in March, but the LA Times never goes back in August because most of those are annuals and they're gone. There's skeletons there and really nothing else besides maybe some few shrubs that are just spaced out. And so I want to encourage you guys, um, and you guys can, can please chime in, to stop using <laughs> annual wildflowers and I think go for more perennial wildflowers stuff yeah. that even when the flowers aren't there the plant is still there and so you guys already threw at least one out which was yarrow and I think yarrow is a phenomenal plant for a wildland naturalistic like almost like a grassland super bloom type tapestry if you removed a lawn and wanted to combine about five different plants yarrow would be perfect Mine, Nicole, you said throw it down. Mine is coyote mint. And I don't get to say coyote oh. mint very much. Yeah, no, because, that's good. because where I work, we just do the local stuff from Sam right. Santa Monica Mountains. But Monardella Viosa, like you can make, wasn't some vato making like beer out of it? Or wasn't he making like, uh, wasn't he using it for like uh, mojitos? <laughs> Evan? I'm sure somebody is, yeah. I think somebody was, yeah. But anyway, yeah. that that's such no, a fact. That flower is so fat, even I could sit on it and sip nectar. I could pull a, a straw out and sip on it. I love um, coyote mint. So yarrow, coyote mint, milkweed in a mixed naturalistic landscape in your front yard. You guys got any, any other ones? Oh, yeah. I mean, we got to call out some for like that late fall bloom, like uh, Bug, Bug Bob was talking about. So uh, I'd say like Solidago, California Goldenrod's a real nice one. That also works with that rain garden concept. You've got that lower lying space in your garden where water tends to collect. Solidago's great. It's going to send up those bloom spikes uh, like late in the summer, early fall with just hundreds of little golden flowers on them. Um, so that's, a, I think, important to think about that year round effect. And on the other end of that, we could also, you know, if you're, if you're, um, maybe a little bit more experienced or willing to kind of take the risk. You want to try growing some manzanita. Those guys bloom real early in the season and the monarchs like those flowers as well. Um, so you can make a nice little, little sandwich with your manzanita in the background, your milkweed in the middle, some nice pretty flowers in the front, like your encelia, the bush sunflower and the achillea, the yarrow. Get some nice layers yeah. going. Another really good um, aster species is the gum plant, Grindelia. Yeah. Um, really good nectar plant. It blooms a little later and it's it's super um, easy. Like you can cut it back. I love plants that you can like forget to water them and they tell you and they, they don't just die. They like, you know that you messed up and then you get, you get a second chance. Unlike a manzanita or a ceanothus where if you screwed up, you're probably yeah. you're in trouble. Like there's no going back on those. But like with, with some, some of the plants, like I feel like Encelia is kind of like this too. Like it'll crinkle up and lose its leaves and you're like, oh crap. And then you, you water it, you know, and it gets right back. back. And the same with the gum plant. Is it the same yeah, gum thing? plant's a really nice one. It really it hugs the ground. It looks great, like kind of at scale. I feel like it's a little bit of like, sometimes it's a hard sell in the pot. Like you look at it in the pot and you're like, oh yeah. But then you see it in a landscape and it's very striking, very aesthetically pleasing. Yeah. And then with that, like Antonio talking about that perennial, like, which is kind of like the, the trend that's the cool design thing, like popularized by like the, the Brooklyn Highline was like a thing that really made that a popular style is that leaving, and this gets beyond just like being good for monarchs, but, but um, just aesthetically interesting leaving stuff or appreciating like the form of the plant outside of just the flowers and the, the actual like, um, I think it's the filleries they're called technically of the gum plant are these little sticky, it's like this little sticky ball, spiky ball that's green. So if you get a whole mass of those going like interspersed with, with some milkweeds and some encelia and some yarrow, like it's just a cool like little textural feature to add. Yeah. I, I love the, the, the plant palette we just created. I want to show you guys uh, some, just these pictures right here. So this is uh, on the right, is the reseeding just establishing itself narrow leaf milkweed kind of skinnier leaf what we would expect to find in an unirrigated garden we water, water this garden twice a month in calabazas and then you can see the same exact garden on the left this almost looks like a like a cannabis plant these leaves yeah. are so big and so the difference is when plants find a little bit more water. And again, we're not watering any different, but the water hangs out longer in shade, right? 
um, and it's not getting blasted as much by the sun. So they're both in flower or about to be in flower, but just the leaves are so much bigger. So we could make a case. I'm not sure that anyone's studied this, but to have slightly more irrigated milkweed and irrigated in or milkweed plants in less intense conditions. So not against a reflected heat wall. Maybe the conditions are nicer in our landscapes where there's a light shade and where there's a little bit more water and maybe that makes more leaves. And does that mean that there's more food for monarchs, right? Totally. Can I throw out one, one plant that's sort of outside of this whole meadow mixed perennial thing we're talking about, right. which is a, sure. actually a species of milkweed, um, the desert milkweed, Asclepia subulata. I don't know if anyone's talked about that, but hmm. I am a big believer in that plant because it's super drought tolerant I, and it's really pretty. And that one is more structural and you could use it in a slightly more formal design if you're going for like a succulent like kind of feel. Um, I don't think it supports monarchs, but it supports tarantula hawks, which are really cool. They're like the, the largest wasps in the world. And so if you have a little like succulent bed, um, definitely pick up a desert milkweed. It's, it's um, yeah, Asclepia subulata. And there's there's one that I, we want to get into cultivation. I, I, you don't really see it out there as Asclepias albicans, which grows in the Sonoran Desert. And it's basically like a, a subulata that's like twice as high. So just picture this, Picture like a desert kind of succulent stemmed plant without any leaves. It's phot photosynthetic stems that's like four to five feet tall and it's a milkweed and it brings these like crazy wasps that are about this big, which may sound horrifying, but they're all, they're beautiful. They're beautiful, yeah. Um, they do, I have heard they have like the worst sting <laughs> imaginable. Oh. Don't, don't get stung by them. Just don't get yeah. stung. But I think that they very rarely sting is what I've been told. Um, but they're super interesting and, and they will come to really urban gardens. Like we've seen them in gardens in the middle of the city. Somehow they find these desert milkweeds and, and if you plant them, it brings those insects in. Yeah. All right. Let's throw out like a few more plants to companion plant with milkweed just to, just to get people excited about them. I'm going to throw it on. Oh, if you got room for a tree, you get a desert willow in there. Those are yeah. pretty easy to grow. They're, you know, low water needs, but they don't mind the extra water. So they're pretty forgiving. Yep. Um, we, we haven't gotten to buckwheats. Oh, yeah. Summer flowering. Like, um, so we have a little monarch sanctuary kit at Theodore Payne. Like a little plug here. It's, it's a seed kit that you can grow. Um, you can basically grow 50, 50 plugs out of it. And it's, it's called the monarch sanctuary kit. It's on our, on our online store. But we one of the plants in that is red buckwheat, um, Iriogonum grande rubescens, which is a classic native plant, killer summer blooms, super pretty. Another one that kind of moves around and travels and is a little, uh, you know, a bit of a wanderer, which is great for this, I think this kind of like palette that we're putting together here. I would guess yeah. there too. Don't, don't want to leave our sages out. Oh, for sure. Definitely some sages. Gonna... I'm gonna go over these topics real quick, just so we've covered just a few ideas that we wanted to. And yeah. then maybe Izzy, if you could throw out uh, one or two topics that people might be uh, asking. So when you guys install milkweeds, when you buy them, ideally let's plant them in groups. Let's, let's create a target for your monarchs, right? So three, five, seven, um, and not too expensive. You can buy the seed, right? If you can buy the seed for $5, you can get them grown um, on your own. It's not too bad. Um, they tend to like, wetter areas. So if you have a decomposed or a DG gravel front yard in Pasadena, that's getting blaring sun wide open, probably not the best spot unless you find an area where the water accumulates after you irrigate or after it rains, right? Usually the places where, you, where weeds come up. I like to treat them the opposite of bulbs. Our native bulbs, um, a lot of times they go dormant during the summer. We don't water them during the summer. So we leave a space open. So we do the opposite with the bulbs. Um, can, can you guys take over real quick? Somebody's vacuuming out here. The, the, glory, the glories of live TV. Yeah. <laughs> I, I'm, I totally agree with what Antonio just said that they are like, I've never thought about this, but it, it's a good way to put it. They are kind of like the opposite of bulbs in that there's, a, there's like a small subset of California native plants that are summer growing. So you've got yeah. um, milkweed is, a, is one of the, big ones and then the other like a lot of the desert grasses 
Yeah, I mean, yeah, a lot of desert natives um, that are perennial because in the desert they're getting a little bit more summer rain than we tend to get here on the cis montane side of things. Totally. Yeah. Um, and that's kind of cool too. Like, is that a, a, like a lot of people think like, okay, it's it's a native plant garden. I don't really do any planting in the summer. You can actually plant a lot of things in the summer. Um, and if you're looking at looking at it from those desert plants, some of the more riparian plants. Yeah, possibly, riparian plants. Um, you just have to be those... strategic and avoid like the hot, like those heat waves. Just yeah. like dodge the heat waves, look for those little cooler windows and aim for those like, just like you're saying, the desert plants, the riparian plants. Yeah. You can garden so, 365 with native. Yeah. Um, a few people were asking in the Q&A and the chat, if your businesses um, do at-site consultations or if you have any recommendations for any other places that do and kind of how to know, you know, specifically for other people's uh, yards, what to do. Yeah, totally. So um, I, I definitely offer consultations in the Northeast Los Angeles area. I try to keep it fairly local. Um, I don't know, Evan, do you guys do consultations as well? We, if you come to the nursery with like pictures, well, we're happy to kind of try to troubleshoot stuff, but we don't do site visits. Um, but there, we do maintain a list of um, native plant landscapers that, that you can find um, on our website. And, and if you come to the nursery, we'll, depending on where you are, we have, we've got people kind of all over SoCal, but if you're in Northeast LA, Nicole Calhoun, Artemisia Nursery, that's who you're gonna wanna, gonna wanna hire, I think. I wanna make a plug, cause I used to work at Theodore Payne I love Theodore Payne. You guys have amazing classes. So sometimes you guys offer design classes mm -hmm. where yeah. folks feel like it. And if they have the cash, they can take their own design class. And I've sat in on those classes. They're intense. They're really, really good. Um, and you're, you guys just started up a landscaper training program. Yeah. Not necessarily design, but it's a bilingual Spanish-English uh, training program, which I think is going to start producing some even more better trained landscapers, right? So how do they find out about that, Evan? Yeah, so um, our website, theodorepain.org, um, has got lots of information on it. Uh, Izzy just put it in the chat, so check us out there. And then our Instagram is uh, at Theodore Payne, our Facebook is at Theodore Payne. And our Eventbrite, which has all of our classes, you can just search uh, Theodore Payne and Eventbrite. We do about 60 classes a year. And Antonio mentioned the design one, that's a great one. You work with a professional landscape architect and they basically take you take you know aerial footage or aerial imagery of your your garden and then they work through like what are you what are your goals what are you trying to achieve it's a three-part uh class and so that one's really cool and then yeah the landscaper training that we've just kicked off is more industry facing which has been pretty uh pretty great to see and um, that's something that the industry just really needs is uh is folks I hear I see some names Brenda and Emerson from TPF those yeah they're they're awesome um uh, and the landscaper training is so crucial because you can have the best intentions with your design and you might even successfully install those plants but if you're not maintaining them correctly or if you have a gardener who's not maintaining them correctly the design goes right out the window so being able to kind of see it all the way through from the inception to the install and then maintaining that garden over the years is really really important so that's awesome that you guys are offering those those classes. Yeah, yeah. And actually, there, it's a really good deal because the class classes are free right now. We have funding from the Department of Water and Power, who, and they've very uh, generously made this free to people who want to take it. You have to be a professional um, to have like a business. And it's not for homeowners now, although we may make it available. And it's, it's an eight-part class. It's about 18 hours total. It covers all facets of kind of native plant gardening and maintaining and I, you know, we're, our, our hope is to get to get a, a really skilled, trained workforce that can maintain native plant gardens, so we can see much more of them um, be out there. And if we do that, we'll save a lot of water, and we'll also support the monarch butterfly and many other uh, organisms. So it's sort of a win-win for the environment. We can rebuild rebuild our biodiversity here in Southern California, and also save water at the same time. And uh, so it's yeah. <laughs> We'd love to love to tell you more about it. Check us out, theodorepain.org. Okay. The, the next talk is scheduled for, I don't know what time. Let me see. 
It's some dude. It's at one by this dude, Antonio Sanchez. So I don't know. <laughs> negative don't seven know. minutes. It's in negative yeah. seven minutes. I don't know how good that talk's going to be. Um, <laughs> anything else you guys want to cover? There's uh, one or two questions, not too much related with design. Uh, someone asked about um, using them in shade, like under oak trees. Um, and uh, working with succulents and milkweed. I think those are, those are two good topics. Um, maybe if uh, either of you, I know you had mentioned succulents and milkweed, um, Evan. Yeah, I think succulents um, could, could definitely work. Um, you know, succulents are, are like pretty, for certain ones can take summer water, Dudley is not so much, but depending on what kind of succulents you're talking about, if, if it's native succulents, um, you know, I mean, just look at where things grow. So you have, you have Dudleya and, and desert, um, desert milkweed, Asclepia subulata growing together in Baja and places like that. So if you're going to go, if you're going to go heavy succulents, I would use the desert milkweed, but you could probably do, um, narrow leaf. I actually have narrow leaf in my succulent bed and it's doing fine. I just spot water it occasionally. So I just bring a watering can and I'll, I'll water that. Um, but I, Actually, I feel like succulent gardens in some ways are more or like almost easier to water because you can summer water them and you like they need less water, but they also can take it whenever. Um, so, yeah, I think it I think it can work. Um, it's just the, the texture of narrow leaf milkweed. It's called narrow leaf milkweed. So it's kind of a little delicate. And if you've got like big, chunky agaves and things like that, it might look a little weird, but you can make anything work. It's just about having the right, you know, getting in the right place in that placement. So the textures work together. Yeah. Yeah. I think under oaks can be a little, a little bit on the tricky side. Um, and I see somebody in the chat, Kim Young uh, called out ribes as a good companion plant that can handle life under oaks. I know ribes arium is attractive to uh, monarchs. So if you have a big oak canopy, I would probably say, you know, try to find like something on the periphery of the shade, not deep in the canopy, and that could be your spot for your milkweed, but then maybe a little bit more under the canopy, you could be looking at things like ribes, um, maybe some of the more shade tolerant Arctostaphylus as well. Um, but yeah, that could be a little tricky to interface, I think the milkweed and the oaks. So I would try to get to the edge of the oak zone and see if you can find any spots around there. I agree with that, definitely. They're, they kind of do like sun. Um and putting them in deep shade is not gonna, probably not going to be too successful doing that. Yeah. Oh, I. Uh, for us? Yeah. Um, there's a. Uh, well, someone's asking for your contact, Nicole. If you could drop that in the chat, yeah. how to get a hold of you, and if you guys could just remind folks where you work and maybe any last closing remarks. Um, I'll, I'll go first. So I'm Evan from Theodore Payne Foundation. Um, my email is really easy. It's just evan at theodorepayne.org. Feel free to reach out. Um, a closing, couple closing things. One is that I think of milkweed in a in this sort of mixed perennial garden as like sprinkles, like you're sprinkling it in. It's not going to be like dominant, but just having them sort of sprinkled throughout can be really beautiful and you can have um, the monarchs. And I also think I'm really glad that Samo fund is putting this on. It's super cool. And Antonio, thanks for putting all this effort into this, just like from a big conceptual place. Like I think of butterflies as actually part of the garden. So like, that's like, you're designing like right now at Theodore Payne, we have so many butter, so many monarchs flying around. We have caterpillars, we have chrysalis. It's all happening right now. And it's just like, that is a design feature, like having a whole bunch of like vibrant orange butterflies just dancing around is a design feature. So that's how you should be looking at your garden. And it goes way beyond monarchs. There's so many other species you can support. So it's really like a, a, a never ending quest to, to learn about all this stuff. But that idea of like this other layer of your garden, it's yes, it's beautiful. Yes, it's a nice place to hang out but really what it is, it's habitat. And all those animals you see are part of your garden. It's part of the design and you've created your own little ecosystem. That's pretty, 
pretty amazing to be part of. So that's what I'll that's what I'll leave with. And thanks for having me out here today. Yeah, here, here, Evan. That's really well said. Um, my name is Nicole Calhoun. I work at Artemisia Nursery. Um, you guys can reach out to me anytime uh, through the nursery emails, just artemisia nursery at gmail.com. Um, I wholeheartedly agree with everything Evan just said. Um, wildlife is, that's why I garden. Um, I really want to say thanks to Antonio Sanchez and to the SAMO Fund for putting this whole event together. It's been awesome checking out the other speakers. You guys are a great crew. It's a wonderful um, being part of a community that is uh, putting so much good work out there to try to support monarchs. And uh, they're basically an ambassador species, right? Like it's easy for us to call the monarch and do what we can to support them. And when we are supporting one species, we end up supporting so many others as well. So thank you guys for all the good work that you're doing. Nicole and Evan, before you guys go, so we're, we're in a band together. I'm not here to promote the band. But one time, Evan, I just got to tell you a story, Evan. When you weren't around, I don't know if you were there, Nicole, but we were like, oh, Evan, we got to get a nickname for him. Do you remember what his nickname was? <laughs> well, we, well, we called his nickname because we have the songs and then he adds amazing stuff on top. Do you remember? Rico, remember? Sprinkles. Sprinkles. <laughs> and, and here you are talking about butterflies being sprinkles. <laughs> All about uh, the sprinkles, everybody. <laughs> yeah. Thank you guys yeah. so much. Big no, hug. You, you, yeah, everyone should also check out our Instagram at Native Sage Against the Machine, which Antonio runs. It's, it's pretty funny. And um, we just played a show last week at Artemisia Nursery, which was such a blast. So, um, yeah, Trump, we're, I think we're, we've got a gig coming up and uh, we had a couple things coming up this summer. So follow us on Instagram to, to find out about those and, and come come listen to us play music. Yeah. Thank you, guys. Applauso. Thank thanks, you guys Antonio. very much. We'll talk to you Thank soon. You. All right. Thanks, everybody. Right on. I don't see um, Izzy anymore. I think she might have got kicked out, like not physically kicked out, but like internet spiritually kicked out. Leslie or Ashley, could one of you come on and confirm that you guys could still see my my um, screen? Yeah, we can see early and late flowering plants. Okay, perfect. So I'm going to go ahead and get started on this talk. Um, this talk I was inspired to do, and I was kind of inspired by a few people just to do, like we as a group were inspired to do this whole conference by a few people. One is uh, Michelle, who's uh, a good friend of ours, and she's a volunteer here at the nursery. And she's been caring about monarchs and milkweed for a lot longer than we have at the, at the nursery. She just has schooled us on all things monarch and milkweed. And she inspired us to collect milkweed seed last year, all that stuff. Um, but I, I went to a few different uh, like conferences and like workshops and stuff. And people were talking about how the monarchs were waking up earlier. And when they're waking up, they might not, if they're waking up even just a few weeks earlier than when they used to 50 years ago, there might not be the same food available for them. And like my dad, rest in peace, he used to have a gas station in Colonia in Oxnard and he used to open up that gas station at four in the morning for the campesinos, for the farm workers. They're working up at four, get their uh, gas and they're off to work, right? In the farms right there in Oxnard. And imagine if those farm workers had to go to work at two, but the, this was back in the 90s, right? In the 80s. And there was no gas station for them at two in the morning. And so I see a lot of parallels between people and plants almost at all times. Whether they're true or not, it just helps me understand life a lot easier. So I want to show you guys the 2 a.m. <laughs> gasoline plants. Um, I, I got to thank so many people that have been part of my life and part of my native plant journey before. Not all of them are listed here, but it would be not cool if I didn't thank folks who have been who've been part of my native plant journey. I'm running a little bit late right now, so I want to just, I'm going to go through some of these a little fast. Uh, some of these plants I'm going to show you guys are uh, just from experience. I can see that monarchs are using them, um, but I also pulled from these three lists, which I highly recommend you guys go see. The Xerces Society has a, a, a whole list on monarch nectar plants for California. Bob Allen, if you go to the Tree of Life Nursery website, Bob Allen has a beautiful list on nectar plants, helping monarchs and other butterflies. And then Theodore Payne, we were just on with Evan. Um, they have an amazing um, blog post about Beyond Milkweed, more plants for monarchs. So a lot of these are, are pulled from there. 
But remember, I'm not pulling the stuff that is kind of easy. <laughs> I think of native plant gardening is really easy between April and July. Like, it's cool. You guys can send me pictures of your flowers, but everyone has flowers at that time. I want to see a native plant garden in full flower in October, in August, in February, right? And it's not going to be as possible as it is in April, but it is possible with some plants. So I'm not going to talk about sages. I'm not going to talk about Cody mints, Achilles. I'm going to focus on plants that are early flowering. So January, February, March, and then stuff that flowers later, August, September, October, November, right? And my focus, even though I'll talk a few about a few different plants, my focus is going to be on plants from what we call the National Recreation Area here in the Santa Monica Mountains. That's where I work. Samo Fund is who I work for. And all we grow are plants from our boundaries, our borders of the National Recreation Area. So we go all the way up to Calabasas, out to Malibu, almost to Oxnard here in Thousand Oaks. So we have a lot of plants to pick from. We have over 600 plants that we could pick from. And so why should we focus on early and late blooming native plants? Hopefully the, the gas station uh, metaphor worked. If it didn't, sorry, I'll come up with a better one. Some people were vibing on the frijoles, the bean metaphor earlier. Maybe I'll switch to that. Um, but we do know that there's slightly shifting uh, monarch migration and waking up patterns. And so we may want to adjust what we're gardening with. Still keep the stuff for spring and summer, but maybe adjust for some early and late stuff. Um, I do have a maintenance class that is going to be taught online next Saturday. I'm going to cover a lot of these topics in there. But part of the battle with our native plants in our gardens is that we want to keep them what I call flexible. Let me give you an example. Hummingbird sage, one of my favorite plants. If you go to hummingbird sage in Ojai in March and April, lush, full leaf, full flower, gorgeous. If you go to hummingbird sage in April, I'm sorry, in August, September, October at the same spot, if it's a small colony of hummingbird sage, you might not even find it. It's there, but it's shrunk so much from lack of water and lack of fog that it goes dormant, right? It goes summer dormant, but it doesn't have to. Me and Evan used to work at Rancho Santa Botana Garden, Inland Empire, basically. It's Claremont, Pomona. It got 110 degrees plus a few years ago. And they had an oak tree there where the hummingbird sage was so thick, it looked like a lawn. And they weren't overwatering, overhead, um, MP rotator type watering every 10 days keeps those plants flexible. And so part of what I'm going to promote here is to try to keep our plants flexible. I'm not saying you should water flannel bush, manzanita, cyanothus during the summer. What I'm saying is some of these plants, and I'll get to which ones, if you keep them a little bit wet, a little bit hydrated, they will reward you with more lush leaves and more flowering during the summer or during the fall or whatever time we're trying to do it, right? And when we do that, we also need to implement some maintenance practices. And the easiest one, especially for small plants, and smaller shrubs, so like sages and whatnot, is deadheading. And all we're doing when we're deadheading is removing flowers that are starting to dry up. So if you look at this picture of giant coreopsis on the bottom right, which is an excellent early blooming pollinator plant, you can see that this plant is about 10% spent or the flowers are about 10% drying up. So for me, it would be important to start to remove these flowers as they're drying up. It's a ton of work, especially if you have more than two or three coreopsis. It's so much work. A lot of times it's easier for us to just shear, to take these garden scissors and to just shear. Um, but if you only have one or two, what I would start to do when you see about 25% of the plant uh, be, um, uh, you start to see it go dormant. I'm sorry, I'm looking at my text to make sure that I can, you guys can see me. Um, is that you want to start removing these spent flowers. If you wait too long, if you wait till about 50% of the flowers are spent, it becomes really hard for the plant. Mentally, I think the plant thinks I already spent energy blooming. I got pollinated. I set my flowers into seed and I'm good. And so we want to deadhead and we want to keep the plant lightly irrigated so that it stays flexible. That's what I call it, it's flexible. And we want to use our pollinator plants in bunches. We don't want to just give our pollinators, whether it's a hummingbird or a butterfly, just one plant to land on. We like to plant in groups of threes, in groups of fives, so that they have a target to find, right? And so I also recommend that we lightly fertilize what I call high-performing plants. A high-performing plant for me is something that I'm keeping awake, like that hummingbird sage, all year, instead of letting it go dormant for five months. And I'm deadheading it, so I'm making it flower way longer. 
And I like to reward those with something very simple. It's not even fertilizer. It's basically um, side dressing with compost or worm castings during the rainy, wet time of year, February or March is perfect. I talk about this concept more in my, rest, in my maintenance class, which happens next Saturday. Um, so please sign up for that. It's free. Um, and definitely don't use pesticides in your garden. So let's talk about some of my favorite late summer plants. These are plants, like Evan said, um, that you could actually still plant right now. They don't mind summer water. Um, they're a little bit more flexible than some of our manzanitas and cianotas. This one is one that I'll admit can be a little hard to find, but we're growing a lot of it here at our nursery and it'll become part of our uh, palette of plants that we start to give away to folks during the fall. So we're gonna start to give away plants to folks uh, from low income areas who can't afford to, um, to purchase possibly their own native plants or folks who are right along the border of the National Recreation Area who maybe got affected by fires. We want these plants in their gardens. So this is Slender Sunflower. The first time I ever saw this plant was at Rancho Santa Ana in Claremont, probably about 2012. And I remember seeing this guy come up April, May, June, just lush in full flower when a lot of other stuff was starting to turn off, like the monkey flowers were starting to turn off, the sages were starting to pass. And this guy was in light shade, looking amazing. So look at these two different pictures. They're both from the Santa Monica Mountains Flowers app. You can see just in full sun, just exposed, <laughs> really dry, dry conditions. And then bottom below in slightly shadier conditions where there's a little bit more water accumulating. This plant can tolerate extra water. It can tolerate clay soil. But the thing that I love about it is that you can deadhead it. So you can promote it and you can actively make it flower more by keeping it flexible, right? By not letting it go dormant. In native nature, it would stop raining about March or April. And then the plant goes through its cycles and wants to shut off we keep it actively growing a little bit. I'm not telling you to put a drip system every two days on your plants. I'm telling, it, I'm telling you to give the plant a light refresher during the summer, actively deadhead those spent flower, um, those seed heads, and you'll see this plant flower all the way to, to fall. So past August and a beautiful small plant, perfect for, for um, almost any, any house in Southern California. This one might take a little convincing, especially if you see it in these conditions in the wild. They call it, and look at these common names. We got to come up with a whole different way of naming plants because shrubby ragwort sounds, I don't want no shrubby ragwort. I think I might have gotten shrubby ragwort one time on the bottom of my foot. That might be a disease. Senecio flaccidus is not the most appealing scientific name either, but I love this plant. I love a lot of native, well, I love all native plants, but there are some native plants that you can just tell in native nature, when you see them, they have something that they would look good in gardens. There's just a feature about them. And shrubby ragwort, when it exists in native nature and it hasn't gotten a lot of water, um, it's a beat up summer, it doesn't look that good. But when it becomes, when you bring it into a formal garden and you tend it and you prune it, it has a look um, kind of like California sagebrush. It's actually very upright and very strong upright growth. This picture right here is a little bit more shade and so it's kind of stretching and growing out. But if you prune this, it's kind of like me. If, you, if I was to just not shave and not do anything for like eight years and I was to come out of just like an oak tree woodland, I wouldn't look so good. But if you cut my hair, I might just clean up just a little bit. A lot of our native plants are like that. When we bring them from outside of five inches of rain and we bring them to these flat areas where most of our houses are at, they clean up beautifully and they respond to deadheading beautifully. So I love this plant. It flowers right through the summer into fall. This is Solidago. This is um, a plant that uh, Nicole had mentioned as part of our uh, palette of kind of wildflowers and grassland landscapes for milkweed. I love this one. The only thing about this guy is if it gets too much water and it's too cool an area, this thing is aggressive. So if you're in Riverside and you hardly ever water, this guy will have a hard time spreading. But if you're in downtown LA and you're watering every four days, this guy's gonna take off. So watch out how you water him because he spreads underground and he will take over your life. He'll jump into your window at night and jump in your bed. That's how aggressive this guy is. But apart from that, if you can tone it down, it does uh, respond well to deadheading. So again, once those flower stalks start to get spent, you can remove them and it will respond as long as you're keeping it flexible, right? As long as you're watering lightly and keeping it growing 
Um, and then I like to cut this guy back to the ground as we do a lot of our underground spreading plants uh, like Matilla poppy, like California fuchsia, cut it back to the ground in winter, late winter, and it'll come back fresh during the spring and summer. All these maintenance techniques I'll cover in my maintenance class next uh, Saturday. So I encourage you guys to sign up for that through Samo Fun Eventbrite. And there's a few other ones that I really, really like. These are more shrubs like Ericamarias, Isocoma menzizii, and Hazardia. These are slightly, to some people, wilder looking plants, but they're some of the strongest summer, fall flowers we have for butterflies. And I'm gonna go skip through this just a little bit, um, just so that I don't go too much past my time. Um, buckwheats, as we mentioned in the milkweed, um, this is my favorite of the local buckwheats for late flowers. And all, well not all, but most buckwheats flower through the summer. This one reliably flowers into the fall. And so I love using this guy um, for the, the gray leaf and then the light pastel pink flower that it has. So here's some that flower all year. And I know it's kind of ridiculous to have a plant flower all year, especially if it's only getting eight inches of rain in native nature, but some of our plants are possible. The only one that grows here in the Santa Monica mountains is Peritoma arborea. And that is, I'm gonna skip one real quick, is bladder pod. So look at bladder pod. On the bottom left is in the Santa Monica mountains, looking pretty ragged. Why would you want that in your garden? I understand, cool. Up above, right next to Chimis in the Barstow Desert. Why wouldn't you want that in your garden? And you can look at the map of where this guy grows in Cal Flora. He grows up against the ocean close to in Malibu um, within half a mile of the ocean. And then he grows out past Riverside in the sandiest of soils. This guy has been named by UC Davis as one of the hundred best plants for clay soil in hot areas. And I agree that this is one of our best plants for butterflies, for flowers almost all year. And I don't know why people don't use it more. I love that plant. I'm going to jump out of the park area real quick and include two other amazing native plants that flower almost all year, especially with your help. And with your help is a little bit of light sharing, a little bit of light watering, and a little bit of nutrition in late winter. Verbena, Lilacina delamina, which you can find at almost any box store now. So anything, any big tool store that rhymes with nose or Gnome Depot, you could probably find there, but you should probably buy them um, or prefer buy them in Artemisia nursery or, or theater paint. Um, this is such an easy plant to grow and it really does flower five or six months at least with a little bit of watering. And then another one that I like that's a lot smaller and is almost a ground cover are the seaside daisies. And again, these aren't found in the Santa Monica's but I think they're good enough pollinator plants and they flower a long enough time where we should use them um, even here in, next, to the, next to our wildland areas in the Santa Monica's. My favorite is WR because you can use it almost in the Inland Empire in full sun. It's just a tough plant. Um, and then Cape Sebastian is a lot wider, two or three feet wide and stays real low. And the key here is the same thing. We wanna cut the flowers off as they're spent and keep them lightly watered, keep them hydrated. I'm not telling you to put a drip system every two days. I'm just telling you to give them water every 10 days, every 12 days. Imagine our, our plants during the summer are running marathons. And if on mile one of a marathon, someone threw water in your face. I mean, that'd be kind of rude, but it would feel really good too. That's what we're trying to do. We're not trying to, after mile one give of a marathon, we're not trying to give our plants a gallon of water to drink. That's what a lot of people do. Here's a gallon, have fun. And they're like, oh, I got to run 25 more miles. If you, if you drink a gallon of water every mile, you're going to get logged down and you're going to kill your native plants. So think of your native plants as running this beautiful marathon during the summer and all they want, they don't need anything but all they want from you to make them amazing is a light splash every mile, right? And so here's some early or late, depending on how you look at it. And I wanna emphasize how important local plants can be. So look at this picture, this map from Cal Flora of where this uh, lizard's tail or seaside golden yarrow occurs right up against the coast. I've tried to grow this many times. I've been successful many times and I've killed it many times in clay soil away from the coast because where it grows is almost always in rocky soil or sandy soil right at the coast. I, I don't think I've ever seen this plant not with the beach in view. So when we bring stuff like that away from the coast, it can be tricky. So instead of that one, we can grow Aerophyllum confertiflorum, which is completely native to Southern California, most of Southern California, and super easy to grow. And it starts flowering pretty early. As early as February and March, you'll find it in flower in a really nice small plant. 
I'm going to fast forward through a few of these. This is Ribes, which is a current, a golden current. This is my favorite native fruit for people to grow, but it's also a really early flower for butterflies. Uh, Nicole mentioned this one um, under an oak tree with milkweeds. Here's another two other uh, options for current. There's the giant Coryopsis that I mentioned earlier. I've seen this guy flowering on uh, Christmas Day uh, sometimes, which is really early. It's more like late January, early February, but a really cool big landing pad for butterflies. And then one of my personal favorites, which I think people should grow more of, is California buttercup. Um, it's a small plant. It flowers its little head off, and it's tiny, so it fits almost anywhere in a small pot. You can shear it. You can cut it back, and it reflowers. It's I, Wherever I've seen it in native nature, it always occurs in, like, kind of clay soils with a shade um, where the water hangs out. So super cool plant that I think people should grow more of. And there's a few other ones. Uh, in say that California was one that Nicole mentioned earlier. Um, it's a nice three foot plant that flowers, you know, reliably in February, March. And then deer weed is one of our most intense <laughs> pollinator plants. When this guy's flowering, there's a lot of stuff around it. So I want to encourage you guys to, uh, I'll check on questions in a second with Izzy, but I want to encourage you guys to check out these three resources, Xerces, which is where I got this list from, apart from just my personal experience. Um, they'll show you pollinator plants for all year, but I'm focusing on early and late. And I want to encourage you guys, if you're interested, I'll cover a lot more of these topics in my training. It's a three-hour online training next Saturday. All you have to do is SAMO Fund event, right? Just Google that and you'll find a native food class that we have going on. I have an advanced native maintenance class, which is even more intense than the beginner, but a lot of our irrigation and maintenance topics are covered in the beginner class. And Izzy, I don't want to keep Mr. Andy waiting too long. He's our next speaker, but can we... Um, See if we got any any common questions that I might be able to answer. Yup. Okay. I'm from my phone now, so we'll see if this works. Um. Okay. Uh, Natalie is saying, in the first year of these plants, do they need more watering? So I guess just talk a little bit more yeah. about watering natives. That's a great question. So here is my philosophy. It's worked for me, and I've done this um, over 15 years. I've used this philosophy about. 12 years. So if you plant a native plant in the rainy season, so that's anywhere from November to March, and you give the plant two to five gallons, the first watering, two to five gallons, the second watering, and then you sparingly water, but you water deep when you do water, in my opinion, that plant is established the first year. And so this is assuming that you're, and I cover all this in my maintenance class, this is assuming that you start with a four inch pot or a one gallon. This doesn't work for five gallons, like bigger pots. They just need more time. They have bigger root systems. But if you can get a plant in the ground in January and with the rain or the cool season and give it tons of water the first few times, they get established really, really fast because they haven't had a chance to get used to the pot. So if you qualify for that, if that is your plant, then to me, your four inch or one gallon plant is established and needs very little water. It needs this marathon run, right? It needs this marathon refresher. You're really not trying to water the roots at that point. You're trying to just refresh the plant. But if you planted later, or if you felt like you didn't get deep enough water, which happens a lot for beginner gardeners, if you didn't get the water deep, so you didn't get two or three gallons into the plant the first time, your plant is not established until it's gone through a good rainy season. And so then you would need to water, not necessarily more often, but you need to water deeper during the summer. And for me, the summer begins in April, right? The days get longer, usually no rain. And so that's when you want to water deeper. And I try to get half a gallon to one gallon of water uh, per plant per watering. Next. Okay, we have a question in the chat that's asking about uh, the mechanics of watering. Mariah says, for the splashes of watering, would you just recommend a short overhead spray or watering the ground around the plant? Yeah, this is a great question. And the, so I, I hate to do this, but there's, this is a, a very uh, intense topic that, I mean, not intense, what's, that sounds so stupid. Like I'm gonna do like 911 on plants. But um, so I cover this more in depth in the native plant maintenance class, the beginner, and it goes even more in depth in the advanced class. But the first thing you want to understand is what plant you're watering. If you're doing a flannel bush, 
if you're doing certain manzanitas or even certain cenotes, those probably shouldn't be watered at all. Some of them you we really shouldn't touch during the summer. Other stuff is more flexible, right? So like there's certain cenotes like Yankee Point that don't mind summer water. Uh, there's certain, there's even a few manzanitas. So those are pretty flexible. And there's stuff that just needs water that's from more wetter areas. Um, and so if you're watering by hand, my rule of thumb is we want to water to get the area around the plant wet. So we're trying to imagine like a rainstorm during the summer, like a monsoon that you might see like in Santa Fe or like Phoenix. So we're trying to change the color on the soil and see how long that takes. And I like to repeat that five times. That's a good, to, to kind of spray paint the soil to get it changing colors. However long that takes was usually five or 10 seconds around a plant. Then we do it again, again, and you're usually watering more than one area, right? And that's usually enough to replicate um, a light rain shower. With the MP rotator or the pop-up sprinklers, it's usually about 30 to 45 minutes of light rain watering because they deliver such little water at such a um, slow pace, right? So it takes longer to kind of change the color um, on the soil. So one more question, Izzy, and then um, I'll go to Andy and I'll be around so I can answer specific questions on the Q&A. Yeah, so Christine says, when you say a plant does well under oaks, can they also do well under sugar bush or Rus ovata? I have a lot of sugar bush on my property, but no oaks, maybe need to change that. Yeah, so an oak tree is it usually, I mean, the older ones have canopies, right? You can stand under them. Um, you can have a picnic under them. That's a very uncomfortable picnic because they're very spiky. So don't do that unless you're a coyote. That's an amazing picnic. So if you're a coyote, you can have picnics under oak trees. What was the question, Izzy? I'm just kidding. Um, so I think we're talking about two different things because ideally under the canopy of an oak tree would be very little plants. In native nature, we see very little out there. We see maybe some random bulbs, some random grasses and whatnot. Um, so ideally there's not much under there and usually roosts like don't, doesn't have a big canopy to, to garden under unless you're forcing that. And even then it's not really something you can stand under normally for most roosts. They're usually about 10, 15 feet tall. Um, so I think maybe you're, you're talking about in front or behind in the shadow of those, of those, uh, plants. I've had no problem, um, growing stuff in, in the shadow of those areas. It's not super, super heavy shade. Um, so I think you can get away with whatever you would get away with in part shade. So like for part shade plants, so like a lot of grasses, some monkey flowers, um, even like coyote mints, um, a bunch of stuff. You probably want to stay away if it's in shade from like penstemons or most penstemons. Um, but yeah, I think you can do a lot of stuff. You'd be amazed as things get hotter. So as you move more inland towards Riverside, plants will tolerate a lot more shade. It's almost like they trade the heat for shade they're willing to. So I'll take more questions in the Q&A, but I want to respect Mr. Andy's time. Um, so th thank you guys for paying attention. I really appreciate that. I wanted to introduce Andy. Andy, and he's one of the reasons that we're even here because I got to sit in on um, one of your meetings, Andy. Um, I think it was probably in January when we first uh, started going to, the, or you started holding those meetings. Maybe I'm, maybe they were. Oh, well, the regional meetings. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah. So, um, I just want to thank you for helping organize that stuff because, because of that and the speakers that you brought, I thought we need to get this stuff out to the public. Yeah. And so we're using a lot of the same speakers that you've been using, a lot of the same topics, and it's been super successful today. So I just wanted to bring you on board to just tell us about the work that you're doing in Ventura County, um, just to give people hope that, yes, people are out there doing stuff and how we can help, Andy. So please take it away. Yeah, no worries. Yeah, I'll share my screen in a minute. But yeah, you were talking about that, the Monarch Regional Advisory Committee. Uh, so that's a pretty much a working group across uh, Santa Barbara, Ventura County, and San Luis Obispo County, led by the RCD, myself, and it's made of different land managers and cities, municipalities, a variety of part partners that kind of focus on resource issues relating to monarchs and pollinators. So I'm happy that you got some benefit from that, and that thing continues quarterly. So anyone who's a land manager and interested in, in one of these areas, please email me. I'll put my, my contact at the end of my presentation here. So let me get into it. I'm going to share my screen here. So give me just a minute, everyone. 
Let me make sure. All righty. Hopefully you guys can see my screen now. Hopefully I get a yes from Antonio or someone. That looks good. Perfect. Thank you. All right, everyone. Oh, sorry. Let me get this zoom out of the way. It always goes in the wrong way. So as Antonio said, my name is Andy Spurk. I'm the resource conservation specialist here at the Ventura County Resource Conservation District. This is our community garden we have. It's a fire escape garden you're seeing, you're seeing in the background. But we're located out in the city of Somis. Uh, so we're a special district of the state of California. My role here at the district, uh, as Antonio hinted at, is to manage projects concerning the natural resources of Ventura County and seek out grants to fund those projects and partners to work with to implement the projects on the ground. So before I start, I want to first say thank you to everyone for being in attendance today. It's, it's a great attendance. I'm really excited to see that. It's great to see the excitement and willingness just for people to get involved and make a change when they need to. You know, I often say in, in my, plenty of my presentations that it will take a city to save the monarchs and pollinators. So, you know, let's work together and, and let's get it done. The front yards, backyards, you know, those gas stations Antonio was hitting at, that, that's important habitat between these larger restorations that I'm going to talk about. So we can't do it on our own. So let's all, let's work together. So I know I don't have too much time here. Start my little clock so I don't go over. So that being said, today I'll be vi talking very briefly about the lo local monarch centric restorations that are going on in Ventura County, at least that are led by the Ventura County RCD. Um, I'll be talking about the future goals we have in mind. And I'll be talking about, in general, about two different habitat types. Uh, we're restoring the breeding and migratory habitat, which typically has the milkweed on site where monarchs mate and forage. And then I'll be talking about overwintering habitat restorations, which is typically, uh, these sites are located kind of in the coastal zone. Um, they don't have milkweed on site. It's overwintering sites are areas of shelters for uh, monarchs in the winter periods when they aren't mating and instead, you know, drinking nectar, clustering together to brave the winter colds. So that's kind of what it's a frame of what I'll be talking about today. We'll get right into it. So I want to start by talking about uh, the future plans we have with respect to the monarch and pollinator restorations throughout Ventura County. And then I'll discuss our current restorations on the ground. So you're kind of looking at our future expansion. And I'll get into that now. So on the map, you'll see that we called out a few different locations for what I'm calling our phase two expansion. Phase one is our current restorations, which I'll discuss shortly after this slide. The locations you see on this map, uh, well, they display a diverse group of partners, if you, if you can read those titles. Uh, they range from privately owned land to land trusts to publicly owned lands. So I'd like to briefly note uh, that, you know, this sort of partnership was intentional. Uh, it's important that we work together across jurisdictions to solve our most pressing environmental and resource issues. And the RCD hopes to portray that mentality through this project and through the diverse partnership. So in general, this map is displaying the larger goal of our efforts, like I said, phase two here. And we, we hope to achieve these restorations in the next five to 10 years, which is creating monarch, which is essentially creating a monarch and flyway network throughout the West County of Ventura, expanding shortly thereafter into the middle and then the eastern portion of the county, which will be phase three of our restorations. And then hopefully moving into phase four, ultimately, which is regional coordination with surrounding um, county restorations, which I kind of hinted at at the beginning with Antonio here. So you note that some of the sites are surrounded by open space, an attempt to link with wildlife corridors. Again, intentionally chosen. This is our phase, our phase two, right? Um, so the wildlife corridors are the green area. So don't mind the light blue color. This map was actually created for a grant, and that's basically the jurisdictional boundary of the agency uh, we requested funding from, from additional restoration in the East County at a school district, which, by the way, is a great place to be restoring habitat because they got a lot of land at schools, and they can do broad landowner agreements to make a lot of restoration on the ground happen. Anyways, so yeah, again, pay attention to the green and yellow areas. Those are the wildlife corridors and wildlife passages that we're trying to link up with. So our restoration program, as you can see, stems from the stems from and follows uh, Xerxes' five steps to recovering the Western monarch population. And I'm going to cycle through these steps shortly. They're going to seem pretty simple, but as you probably know, it's far from it. But it does provide a great guide and narrative uh, when we seek funding for such efforts through grant offerings and donations by following these five steps. Because keep in mind, like many restorations, 
we don't receive a stable source of funding for our efforts. So we rely heavily either on grants, which I write myself or others, or on donations to actually fund these, uh, these restorations. So your note, the first topic on the list here is protecting and managing California overwintering sites properly. Although no milkweed's present, I know this is a milkweed conference, at these locations, it's important that we note that overwintering sites, if haven't already been discussed, are critical habitat for monarchs, right? It should be good to hear that uh, we are accomplishing this first step and expect to expand into Camino Real and Harbor Boulevard overwintering sites uh, in, in the city of Ventura shortly. But part of this first step, other than restoration, is protection, which is substantially lacking for monarchs and pollinators. Luckily, overwintering sites are within the coastal zone, so many of you may know that they do have a level of soft protection under the Environmentally Sensitive Habitat Area designation from the California Coastal Act. So welcome protection, of course, but it is a very rarely, well, it's getting less rarely, but very rarely ever enforced, such as, such as one of the restorations I have in Oxnard where it got overlooked and actually about half of the habitat got taken away, unfortunately. So our next step we follow, we're slowly evolving, as you can see on the map here, into breeding and migratory habitat sites, which is the majority of our phase two expansion. Again, I'll talk about phase one right after this slide. So we're currently in talks right now with the state and the federal government to secure additional funding to restore about eight of our breeding and migratory habitat sites. We should know about this funding by the end of this year. And if awarded, the funding would also pay for extensive community outreach campaign, a local nursery and coordination to sell important monarch and pollinator plants to the public and a unique monarch alert system, which I'll talk about in a minute. And leads kind of into my, the next step of Xerxes, uh, key steps to restoring monarch habitat. Um, so to accomplish protecting monarch and their habitat from pesticides, we're trying to create, if funded, a unique and regional tri-county monarch alert system, which would track migrations and notify landowners, residents, farmers, land managers, residential cities um, of impeding migrations from monarchs, basically. Um, we would provide tips and actions to take in preparation for the migration as they're coming through our area, such as reducing chemical use, cutting back milkweed that hasn't died back or isn't native. Uh, planting nectar and pollinator resources at the correct times of the year for bloom periods, as Antonio was talking about, and the such. It's kind of all would be wrapped up in this alert system. So it'd be, at first, we'd create the system through email notifications with the future hopes of building an application that would be free to download to the public, just as like Monarch Mapper, or Milkweed Mapper, or those other applications. You know, so I believe that could provide, you know, if we do get it funded and we do this monarch alert system, it could provide some widespread soft protection for the populations as they move through our area. And keep in mind, I'm, I, I'm saying monarchs, but I'm also referencing all pollinators in this. So we'd be talking about other important aspects in that alert system. So the next step, you know, of course we got is answering key research questions and restoration of monarch habitat outside of California. So of course, as we restore sites, we will start to conduct research presented at regional meetings throughout the West and at local groups or opportunities such as this to outreach our projects. Additionally, uh, we're pretty, pretty inclusive with what we do at the RCD. So everything we develop from restoration plans to site informational plaques even, like one of these plaques that we put up at all of our restorations for information, we will only share that with any interested groups doing restoration, again, in hopes of encouraging widespread regional coordination, which I've been saying is it's going to take a city to save the monarchs and pollinators. So, you know, that, that's what we're trying to do. Let's work together. Let's get out of our silos and let's make a difference together. So if we do get this expansion funding that I'm talking about for this phase two, we'll be have, having plenty of volunteer opportunities. So I'm just going to give a quick plug. We have plenty of volunteer opportunities for the next four years at our site's starting in 2022, all the, at most of the sites you see on the screen right now. So of course, we're always looking for people to join our volunteer force. We have a pretty good one. Uh, it's pretty active. So if you got some free time and some free hands, I, I encourage you to contact me and we can add you on. So shoot me an email if you're interested. Like I said, plenty of planting days are going to be coming and it will take a city. So we really, really need everyone's everyone on deck here to help us. So you kind of got our, our broad stroke, what we're trying to do in the next 10 years or whatever for restoration. So now 
I just want to real briefly talk about our current restorations that are going on the ground. And again, I'm, I'm summarizing this stuff real quick. There's much more detail I'm going to go into, but mm, that's for another time. So you'll see here, we have our three current overwintering restorations happening right now. As I said, these sites don't have milkweed. They're just overwintering. So they're within the coastal zone. But they do allow for monarchs to shelter and cluster during winter time, right? When they're migrating down here. So it's very important we maintain these sites. Uh, these are sites that we need help with uh, from volunteers and the ones that we'll be hosting upcoming volunteer planting days at. So the sites span from Santa Barbara County down to Ventura right now. So you got the Douglas Family Preserve, you got Carpenter Creek, and then you got the Winnemi Masonic Cemetery. And of course, you know, uh, my jurisdictional boundary as an RCD is Ventura County, but I am working with RCD, Kachuma RCD in Santa Barbara County with the two Santa Barbara sites. So further encouraging that collaboration across jurisdictional boundaries. So as I've said, right now you're looking at phase one of our project. And as you know, phase two is hopefully going to be funded later this year by the state and result in the restoration of additional breeding and migratory habitat. So we'll talk real quick about what you're kind of seeing on the screen here. You're going to see the, the, the orange area. So as you, if you haven't been able to tell already, that's the focus area of our restorations at all of these sites, primarily. Um, that, the one on the far right, the Winnemi Masonic Cemetery, it's a more of a, a U around the entire boundary. But nonetheless, those are our focus areas. That's where we do our detailed, our detailed habitat plans, which I'm going to talk about shortly. And uh, that's, yeah, that's just where we kind of start the restoration. And then, you know, keep in mind, these restorations are long-term restorations. And I'll talk about that shortly after this too. But I do want to note, we do have goals that you'll see here for phase one, but also I want to note the funders. It's really important. So this, this phase one is funded by the California Wildlife Conservation Board, a state agency, through a California RCD block grant. It's also funded by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service Partners Program, which is an amazing program to work with, by the way. Anyways, I just, I'm really wanting to highlight that diverse partnership that's needed. You know, we're working with local, state, regional, and West Coast experts to get these restorations done. It's not just me. There's a whole team behind me. There's so many other experts who know plenty more than I do that are assisting us with these restorations. So here are just a few starts. So... Here are just a few shots of our current Oxnard restoration. Uh, this is near Oxnard College. For those of you who know the area, it's down the street. There's kind of a 7-Eleven. And then you see a cemetery and it's a Japanese cemetery. It's on the other side off Edding Road. Um, and uh, so we expect to, you know, finish this restoration at least in the next few years. But we just planted one of our last plants on site here. And we're going to move on to our next restorations at Carpenter Creek and Douglas Family Preserve after summer of this year to make sure we plant before raining season for one of them, just as Antonio was hinting at earlier. Saves us watering and, and really just helps the plants out. So I'll talk about this site real briefly because that's what we're almost done implementing. Um, so the Oxnard site started on the ground work in February of this year. And we just put down, like I said, about our 300th plant in the ground this past Tuesday, I want to say it was. Uh, the plant species, you know, they, it's a wide range of plant species we're putting in there. Antonio, we got plenty of what he talked about. So we got Monterey Cypress. We got some Toyons there for windbreaks. We, of course, got Ceanothus, different Yarrows. And, of course, we got the deer weed. Um, you know, we want to make sure we get those nectar and pollinator pollen resources and the bloom periods. So those are just some of the plants we use. Uh, it's not the entire plant palette. But it's exciting that this restoration is almost fully implemented. And of course, we now have the long road ahead of us for monitoring and maintenance, ensuring plant survivability and longevity of the site. And that's why I'm going to get into detail just after this slide, how we do that. But before we move on, you know, one primary reason this restoration was implemented so quickly and efficiently was due to the community involvement. The location is a cemetery, as you can kind of see. Um, but it's an outdoor green space, and it's hard to imagine that, but it really is an outdoor green space. It's almost like an outdoor gathering area for the local community. They actually hold a yearly monarch festival here on site for Ventura County. Let me know and feel free to reach out. And I'll let you know those contact info. They're going to do one this year or next year. Um, and actually, this site is going to be featured on the Travel Channel pretty soon, ironically. 
So this site has some importance other than the cemetery and the restoration. The community is connected and it really shows. There's a community group that leads and helps me with all the restorations. They organize more volunteers. And I'm just trying to say that, you know, we couldn't be doing this without everyone's help. You know, I have a team that can go out and plant stuff. But on the left here, you see a photo, my left, of all of our volunteers. When we're out there, we're doing education with them. We're doing, you know, handing out plants, handing out seed packets. It's a whole event other than just putting a plant in the ground. And we're really appreciative of the efforts. So now I'm at 14 minutes, but I'll be wrapping up here pretty soon. Now that you know about the restorations, I'd like to briefly talk about how we kind of holistically go about implementing these restorations because they're complicated. Um, and like I said, it's not just me doing this. It's a whole team. I get the luxury of having my face painted on it, but I just want everyone to know that there's a lot of people working behind the scenes. So I've, as I've said multiple times now in this short presentation, it takes a city to get these restorations done and for us to save the population. The RCD works with local, regional, and state expert consultants, such as All House and Mead, to develop our restoration plans. We sit on statewide and regional working groups, such as the Monarch Regional Advisory Committee Working Group, another statewide group, and some West Coast groups to understand the best available scientific practices. And of course, we rely on volunteers such as yourself to get the boots on the ground work implemented. So the first step, well, to any restoration really, is to understand the site, right? And to understand the site, you create a management plan. So these plans, or habitat management plans, as I like to call them, these plans are long-term guiding documents that lead in the restoration of our sites. These habitat management plans will provide expert guidance that enhances the value of the site for overwintering monarchs, if we're talking about overwintering sites, and it will ensure that long-term plant survivability. We're, we typically try to fund the entire management plan, but most of the time, or a lot of the time, these management plans are so detailed that they actually, and they're expected to do this, they, are, they require more funding than is present. And the reason for that is so we can, you know, one, we're detailed. We want everything done in that plan or everything that needs to be done, we want in that plan. But now we can use this plan to go to other funders and request more money and say, hey, we got a plan. We've already got funding from this partner, this partner, and this partner. We need funding from you to finish it. So it's a great, like I said, it creates a great argument and a great narrative for future funding. So what do these plans look like? Well, like I said, they include long-term monitoring. They include long-term maintenance protocols, um, guidance for planting, planting palette and locations. They look at the light analysis through the plant canopies using fisheye lens. Uh, it's really interesting uh, science with that. Uh, they also sometimes use LIDAR and understand how light, how sun's entering the canopy and where the gaps are coming from above. So we can understand what plants need to come in to provide better, you know, better protection in habitat. They also discuss site constraints on resources, such as soil type, right? Hydrology too, that's all important, especially when we're talking about large scale restorations. And of course they have best management practices that enhance plant survivability, you know, prevent pesticide drift, increase access to nectar resources and all that good stuff. So again, these plans provide a great argument for funding. And it's also a great thing to share with people if they just wanna know how restorations are going about. So the next step when we do our restorations, you know, uh, is, like I said, restoration and monitoring. So the RCD, the Resource Conservation District, will implement the management plans throughout the next five to 10 years, like I said, at each site, at least. But we expect to engage with the community and have planting days. And, and these days, like I said, will double as educational outreach, you know. So what I'm getting at is whenever we do a restoration, we're connected there long term. And we're connected with the community long term. So we expect to be there for a while and we expect to bring more and more funding in because we want to see a success just as much as anyone else. We don't own land. We go and we restore other people's lands and we respect that partnership. You know, and we understand it. So other than just restoring an area, we also want to understand how plants are being utilized, if they are being utilized and if we are attracting monarchs and pollinators like we hope to be. So to accomplish this, we do conduct biannual detailed habitat surveys. We just did one last Friday at our restoration sites where we catalog site success and also conduct yearly overwintering surveys at our overwintering sites because they're so critical. Um, and that's actually with the help of our volunteer force. So we train volunteers to go out and count monarchs as they're roosting and clustering. It's a really interesting thing and we're happy to train you. You don't need any experience and it's a great thing to do on a Saturday 
during the overwintering period, which is, you know, give or take around from November to February or March, give or take a month, depending on the climate. So we will send those notifications out in the coming months to start training and moving forward with that. So again, please reach out to me and let me know if you're interested. So now the final component of, of all of our restorations, of all of our activities that we do at the district really is education. Um, the RCD and like many other RCDs throughout the state, there's about 99 of us, uh, believe that part of the solution to a changing climate is education. Engaging with the next generation to take over and ensuring we take time to educate those who are set in their ways. So to be blunt, we can't just expect change to happen. We need to introduce the issue to the next generation while also understanding that the current generation, you know, some stuff happened that probably shouldn't have. So during each planting day, we talk for about 30 to 45 minutes for an educational talk. We do Q&A sessions with volunteers. People ask us about plant choice on how to take care of plants, similar to the questions that were coming up from Antonio. We talk about the decline of the monarchs. We talk about the decline of the West Coast population of the monarchs. And we answer some other questions that people want to have. And like I said, hand out seed packets and all that. My point being here is that we're very holistic when we do everything. We want to get out of our silo and get the community involved because we can have these large scale restorations that occur throughout the whole county, throughout the whole California. And it's great. And it's really important. But we need these gas stations, these way stations in your front yard, your backyard, your side yards. So as monarchs and pollinators are flying in urban and built environments, they can stop, they can rest, they can refuel as they go from large restoration to large restoration. So it's important we educate people on that. So before we finally conclude here, I want to let you know what you can kind of do to make a difference if you haven't already been told today enough. But what you do on the local level, if I haven't said it, it really truly does matter. We will never have enough funding to mitigate all of our environmental needs. But with the help of volunteers and dedicated community members, we can accomplish our goals. It's not just free labor, it's really essential. Putting natives in your yard creates essential habitat for pollinators as they move through our urban environment, like I was just explaining. And being able to time those blooming periods, that's just, that's icing on the cake there, as Antonio was saying. We need to get used to native plantings browning. It's a natural occurrence. So the solution I'd like to recommend is intermix blooming periods, if you haven't already been told that, into your garden. So as one native goes dormant, you know, you got another native or a few other natives popping up at the right time. And then lastly, stand up, make your voice heard. Attend community scoping meetings and planning meetings. The government really does listen to you when you have enough people stand behind you. And I didn't go into detail about what happened at my Oxnard site, but there was an oversight in the approval when the planning committee uh, approved a low-income high-density housing, very important housing development. But there was an oversight and the community did not realize they did not show up at the scoping meeting and it's been moved forward. So show up, make your voice heard and, and set, just set your feet in the ground and root in the ground. You can really make a difference. So anyways, with that, I know I was really briefly going through everything, but I really appreciate the time. Um, I appreciate you guys inviting me here and all of you taking the time to listen and, and show your dedication. So uh, I'll kind of end it on that. And that's, that's kind of my, my presentation there. If you had any questions, I'm, I'm happy to answer them. Let me try to stop sharing my screen. Thank here. you. Thank you very much, Andy. Um, so we do have, um, I'll let Izzy uh, come after this question, but there's a lot of folks asking about Santa Barbara, Simi Valley, LA, Orange County. I know Richard, who's going to talk right after you. And I talked to Richard right now. He's cool with us spending a little bit more time. If you're cool, Andy, going over <laughs> our time frame. Um, but Richard said he's about to talk about the San Fernando Valley, I believe, okay. and how folk can help in the LA area. Um, and cool. then we have another gentleman speaking about that. So what about uh, like Ventura Barbara. County, Santa Barbara? Yeah. Yeah. So it's a really good question. Um, and I'll tell you, there's a lot of, if you haven't already been or haven't already noticed, been told, there's a lot of behind the scenes stuff going on right now in the legislature. Um, there's a lot of push going on trying to either re-review -re the status of the monarch. But on the even getting, you know, even on the smaller level, our county supervisors, county of Ventura, um, just, I don't know, um, Antonio or whoever, correct me, I want to say it was two or three weeks ago, just released um, uh, a new order to county-owned land. And now on county-owned land, they need to not only protect monarch habitat, but they need to start encouraging monarch habitat by planting more milkweed. So that's one action that's happening. And I, I will tell you, I just had a conversation last week with a 
kind of a lobbyist group up in Santa Barbara County. And they were asking me about, you know, how can we get your efforts up here? How can we do more stuff up here? Um, and that's what I'm doing with the Kachuma RCD up to my north. We're working together to do that and get that done. But I sent them, I said, hey, first step, get your board of supervisors, you know, the county supervisors, get them on board. Get them to start giving some protection needs. Get them, you know, so I afforded the protection that our county just actually awarded Monarchs. You know, it's, it, it doesn't have much teeth to it, but it's a great, great starting point. So there's stuff going on slowly but surely. Um, my Monarch Regional Advisory Committee does have land managers from like San Luis Obispo even, and they're doing restorations. I think right now you don't see a lot of on the ground opportunities for, to volunteer or just to, to know about is because a lot of people are developing their plans, but I do think in the next few years, you're going to start seeing the rollout of a lot more restorations. Yeah, it's not happening tomorrow like we would love it to, but it is in the pipeline. Um, you know, this stuff takes time. I mean, my Oxnard restoration was a year in planning before I even got on the ground earth breaking one. So there's stuff going on. Um, Santa Barbara, I think I might be the only one doing restoration up there for at least this wide scale for Monarchs, but I'm not too sure. So I don't want to misquote that. Hopefully that answered your question. I think on a tangent there. Easy. Yeah, so um, I see one uh, question in the chat. Um, let's try to find it. Loretta is asking, can we read any type of management plan? Is that the same as a feasibility plan? Yeah, you know, you can. And I, you know, and I, I always say, and, and I, I got it. If I'm preaching it, I'm going to do it. So if you want to read a management plan, you want to understand what it's like, um, feel free. I'm going to throw my contact info into the chat here. I'm always open for any questions. Shoot me a question. And oh, one second, let me type this in before I give you someone else's wrong email and they're getting a bunch of butterfly emails. So there's my contact in there. Uh, feel free to reach out. I'm happy to share the restoration plan. Um, I always think it's important for community members who are involved in this type of work to understand what's going on. Because when I, you know, when I was on the outside, I was always going, well, what's happening? How are they doing it? Not that I want to say they're doing it wrong, but I just want to understand. So I'm happy to share it. Um, please reach out. It is similar to a feasibility plan. Um, it's very detailed. Uh, so yeah, the only way is just to read it. They're usually about 60 to 80 or 90 pages long, give or take on the site, how big the restoration is and all that stuff. But, uh, but yeah, feel free to reach out. I did see another question here. I don't mean to answer in, in case someone else was asking. Uh, is the Ventura City coming on board with restorations? They are. So I just had a large meeting last week with my phase two partners. So that's about 10 partners. And, oh, sorry if my internet's cutting out. But the city of Ventura is coming online. What we're going to try to do, if we do get our funding awarded from the state agency at the end of this next quarter, the, we will be working at Camino Real Park and... Uh, the Olivia's golf course to do a rest breeding migratory habitat at, at Olivia's golf course, but then at Camino Real and Har uh, to do actually a new management plan. Uh, we won't be doing on the ground restoration unless I secure additional funding, but, uh, but yeah, city of Ventura is coming online. They got a lot of critical and really good habitat too. Um, and they're really excited about this and they want to do all they can. So it's just a matter of me, typing fast enough to get the grants in and to get the funding. I hope that answered your question. I love, I love Camino Real Park. It's such a cool park. That'd be cool it to is. see work. It's so easy to get to for a lot of folks in Ventura and Oxnard too. So yeah, um, it is. And, you know, I'm sorry to cut you off and talk, but before I forget, you know, the Oxnard restoration, you know, we, I'm happy to do a tour. If people want to get out there and see what's happening on the ground, that's an open site. You can go walk around yourself. I can give you the address. Camino Real, it's an extremely involved community location. And I'm looking forward to engaging with the community on that one. You know, like I said, when we come and do we do a restoration, I don't like coming anywhere saying I know best and you don't. Um, the landowner owns the land. They most of the time understand the land. So I come to enhance their understanding and do it the correct way and work with them. So when we go to public lands, we have that same mentality. We're going to work with the city, but we're going to have scoping sessions with the public. As we're creating these management plans, we're going to ask them, what do you want to see in it? What do you want to see in your backyard, essentially, right? Because Camino Real, there's, there's homes that directly abate that. 
and they're really connected to it. And I think they should be a part of the solution as we're trying to solve, solve our resource issues. So community involvement, it's always top of my priority at the end of the day. Andy, I'm looking forward to the next meeting. Uh, Thank is you so much. The general, is the general public invited to hang out at these meetings? Uh, it's every quarter, right? Every three months? It is every quarter. Uh, they're not yet invited, um, but, you know, I wouldn't be against it. So maybe I'll talk with you offline on that one, Dan, um, yeah, because the yeah, group I just started this year. So we're just trying to get some footing. But again, you know, if I'm preaching it and I need to be I need to be dishing it. So, yeah. you know, it would be a great way to people just to get involved and understand because I think there's so much going on. And sorry, I don't mean to take up my time, Richard, but there's so much going on on the ground level here that the community, I think, can get overwhelmed. So if we can give them an opportunity to understand and get involved, I think that's important. So maybe I will open it up sometime next year to the public, maybe like one or yeah. two sessions a year. And and uh, and we might not even have to open those sessions, Andy. We might just, I think the reporting to the public and like letting them know like that people are doing stuff, like Richard is doing stuff, Bob Allen, or yeah, Bob Allen is doing stuff. Um, CMPS Santa Monica is doing stuff yeah. to let people yeah. know because I think people are freaked out, right? And so yeah. we want to keep them in their mind. These are the five things to do. Cut back your tropical milkweed grow this in the March and then mm. look at what, and it's almost like a, like a website or something you, for Southern California milkweed, right? Just an update, like an Instagram or something. We need but, um, something that has that collective knowledge yeah, to let people know. Like, accessible. Yeah. When I freak out, I reach in the, it's probably not good for me to say this, to admit this, but when I freak out, I open the fridge and have a beer. So yeah. when people freak out about monarchs, maybe they can go to Southern California milkweed.org and see the restoration sites coming up, the meetings that are happening, right? That that would be ideal for maybe something I love that idea. That's yeah. a really good idea is if we can centralize this info. And then that goes for plant lists because I'm sure all of us get the quest, same questions. What plants? What plants? It's a great question. Yeah. So let's start creating a centralized spot to download that. I love that. I idea. thought you were going to say the great idea was the, the beer in the fridge. Andy? Oh, that's always you. a good idea. I never <laughs> say no to that. <laughs> Just don't Richard. give up. Just make it an inspiring moment, right? We're doing LA at this very moment. Andy, thank you so much. Thank I'll you. see you very soon. Richard, apologies. Thank you so much for, for being patient with us. Um, I want to introduce uh, Richard Rackman. He's a botanist and graduate student at Cal State Northridge. He's joined us today to talk about action that you can take in LA to conserve milkweed habitat. Richard. Thank you so much, Antonio. Uh, let me share my screen. Um, and get started. Okay, hope this is good for everyone. Um, today I'm going to be talking about Los Angeles, how you can help milkweed and monarchs where you live, right? So I noticed in the chat everyone had these individual areas that they were curious about, Long Beach and Orange County, and, you know, they can be hours of hours of driving away. So you wanna know what you can do where you live, right? So hopefully this will be a framework for kind of all across Southern California as well, not just LA County. So where am I, right? So I first wanna acknowledge I'm on Tatambium land. Um, they are the original caretakers of this land and do a much better job of it than a lot of the European colonialists. Um, so part of my belief is that this and other people's beliefs is that they should have the land back. Um, we should pay rent as colonists and we should be giving to indigenous organizations. Um, I'm gonna put in the chat, if I can, a link to a bunch of, um, let's see if it works. I'll do it after. Um, it's going to be a, a bunch of these links, and including this uh, campaign that the Tatamium Nation is doing for education. Super cool stuff. Um, please give to local organizations where you live that support Indigenous people and giving um, power back to them. Okay, who am I, right? I am someone with entirely too many titles. Um, I'm the Biodiversity Coordinator for the CSUN Institute for Sustainability. It's Cal State Northridge. I'm a graduate student studying oak trees in the Santa Monica Mountains National Recreation Area using remote sensing, ground truthing, um, some botanizing. I'm a botanist. I really love studying rare plants. I love studying charismatic megaflora, megaflora like oak trees. 
I like studying weeds and discovering new weeds in Los Angeles. I'm all about those invasive species. Um, and I'm also the Los Angeles County Western Monarch Count Volunteer Coordinator. It's a mouthful, and I'll talk more about that. And I'm a, a queer Jewish boyfriend to my wonderful and patient partner who's currently watching this talk as well. <laughs> so why does my identity matter? Why, does, why do any of your identities matter, who you are, right? Let's talk about the identity of milkweed, right? Uh, milkweeds are ruderal species. They are disturbance adapted plant species. So this narrow leaf milkweed with a tarantula hawk on it, which is a pretty common sight on like that association, right? This narrow leaf milkweed is in a grassy field that's probably this, I think this was in Paramount Ranch, uh, that's seen a lot of anthropogenic effects, a lot of ranching, a lot of really heavy handed uh, agriculture, right? But milkweeds thrive in these environments. So they, um, heavily adapted to be in these sorts of places that are, have undergone so much stress, right? Um, um, and so what, what I wanna say is our experiences, the good, the bad, our work experiences, our personal lives, they really define us as conservationists. And it's important to embrace those moving forward because they inform our decision-making, our volunteer opportunities, um, the actions that we take, the organizations we associate with. The other thing I want to talk about, aside from being a rural, right, is collectivism. And what, what's the connection to monarchs, right? So monarchs migrate in these gigantic, uh, used to be, these gigantic populations, right? Um, from the mountains to the coast or on the east coast, like from north to south into Mexico. And there's strength in numbers, right? They, they, they migrate together to overwhelm predators, right? And I wanna call for you all to do the same. You're, you're not responsible for saving the monarch. You yourself, you're, you yourself did not put the monarch butterflies in this situation and you yourself are not gonna save them. So, but as a collective, we can do so much better. B is the monarch flying en masse, right? Not the tarantula hawk, even though I think they're super cool animals. Don't be the tarantula hawk out by yourself as a lone wolf, right? There's strength in numbers. And I really want, and there's a bunch of mariposa lilies that I just think are really pretty, but there's strength in numbers. And I really want you to, to hold on to that. Part of that is permits, permission, and direction. So we are so much stronger as environmentalists when we work together with organizations that are doing existing projects. Part of that, in part of like the project management, right, is the permitting process. And this is where agencies, scientists, researchers, they get permits to either collect specimens, to plant specimens, um, to get seeds, to do gardening in certain areas, to restoration work in certain areas. In this permitting process and getting permission from land management, agencies. This is important to prevent plants and animals from being poached, right? You don't want to just go out there and collect a bunch of monarch butterflies and bring them back into your house because you think you're helping, right? You could be hurting the population. And this kind of mixing and matching of mon milkweeds and monarchs and stuff, it, it can also damage gene pools, right? So milkweeds and monarchs can be specially adapted to certain regions of the United States. And so mixing up these sorts of things too often can really cause a lot of damage. So you want to be quiet. Thank you. Um, so you really want to be careful about um, causing damage to local ecotypes. Okay. So with all that said, I want to go into projects in LA that help with monarchs and milkweeds. Okay. So first and foremost, I'm going to talk about the main project that I'm working on this fall and winter, and that's with the Xerces Society doing the Western Monarch Count. So I'm the Los Angeles County Volunteer Coordinator. So what you would do, and I'm going to post these links onto the chat after. So what you would do is you would go on to this website, so sign up to be a monitor, and then uh, Xerces Society will send you more information on what that means, what sites you're gonna monitor. Uh, and then I'll coordinate with you as well. Around Thanksgiving and Christmas time, emails, like I said, emails are gonna be sent out about trainings. You're gonna get your binoculars. You're gonna go out really early in the morning, right before the sun hits. 
And then we're going to look at monarchs that are resting on trees, right, overwintering. So these are different than the residential monarchs that we may have at Cal State Northridge or all around Los Angeles, right? So these are monarchs that are persisting in cities year after year. But th these monarchs that we're most interested in are the migrating monarchs, right? So this is a, a volunteer opportunity for you to get involved. Research on the ground, really important stuff. This map that I found of, was from a really fascinating article that I believe one of the speakers was a part of, Stephanie McKnight. Maybe, I'm, maybe she wasn't speaking today, but um, about monarchs and how wildfires are affecting monarch populations, not only like milkweed areas, but also riparian corridors that are overwintering sites as well. So really fascinating stuff. And you could be a part of this kind of research, which is really important. Now, uh, I'm a huge fan of the California Native Plant Society, right? I, I was in the chat, like dumping like the, the South Coast California Native Plant Society, Orange County Native Plant Society, San Gabriel California Native Plant Society, Riverside. There's just so many chapters that you can get involved in. These are, this is where you get your teeth as an environmentalist. This is where you could go into a, a, into a county meeting, into your local meeting and say, I'm a member of CNPS. Um, I wanna help um, protect this uh, wild space for monarch butterflies, right? This is where you getting involved with other people that wanna support you and champion the causes that you believe in as well. If you can give money, that's great. If you can't give money, that's fine too. They have scholarship opportunities for students. They have volunteer opportunities for students. A lot of times they're even hiring. So CMPS is just an amazing organization. Now, the one that I'm involved with most is the Santa Monica Mountains and Los Angeles County CMPS. Uh, we've kind of carved out a lot of our um, activist, like kind of restoration activities on the Sepulveda Basin Wildlife Preserve. It's about a hundred acre space. Um, it's incredible. It's beautiful. It used to be like cornfields and a ton of invasive species. And now because of the work of CNPS, it's bustling with native species, has thriving monarch and um, milkweed populations. Really cool. So on the second and fourth Saturdays, they do weeding events or they're trying to get that really going. And as well as weekday mornings, um, they provide tools and they'll do training as well. If you're interested, you can uh, contact me or contact George and I'll give you the link after my talk for his email. Um, but please just join your local CMPS chapter, get involved, get a board position, donate money if you can, don't donate money. Like use CMPS to champion your local, like there's someone that's in uh, Pasadena that's having um, a bunch of like California walnut habitat in, in their backyard affected. And like a lot of CNPS, CNPS members are interested in this very particular project. Like that's the sort of thing CNPS can do for you. So please get involved. Tree People. Now Tree People is like this LA institution, super cool. They're, they're working out of like Paramount Ranch uh, with NPS. They have a lot of restoration going on there. And also San Francisco Canyon, which has gone through a ton of environmental degradation and in devastation and and so they're doing a lot of restoration in this area and here they have a ton of milkweed um and the both of these sites have a ton of milkweed so if you're interested in like literally helping with milkweed and monarchs um tree people can hook you up with these sites so um i've linked their calendar right and that's where you can find their events um a lot of the sites they work on have also a ton of endangered species that they're helping to monitor and to help preserve. Um, they also have a native plant um, nursery off Mulholland. If you wanna learn from Jack, he's one of the most knowledgeable native plant people in LA. I really like talking with him. Um, please get involved, maybe even donate your time at the nursery and le learn more about propagation. You can go on their calendar or you can also go on their uh, social media page on Instagram and Twitter and stuff. Oh, wow, the CSUN Institute for Sustainability. So uh, this is where I work I, as the biodiversity coordinator. We have a thriving monarch population. We have over 40 native plants all throughout the acre property, as well as a native, um, as well as a fruit and vegetable garden where we donate hundreds of pounds of produce every year to food pantries like the CSUN Food Pantry and the uh, MEND, which is a, a which is a food pantry in the San Fernando Valley. Um, come donate your time with us. Uh, learn about weeding, 
learn about urban farming. And we're really trying to get this program going with uh, native plant propagation and kind of um, layering, um, you know, fruit and vegetables, edible plants, native plants, pollinator spaces. We even just installed like 25 coffee trees. It's a really funky space and we can always use more volunteers. So here's the link there if you wanna get involved, I, I highly recommend it. Um, and now I'll take questions. I've, uh, here's my Instagram, my Twitter, my iNaturalist, please, please, please download iNaturalist, go get involved in community science. Um, and if you wanna just talk my head off about you know, conservation and uh, please email me. I think this was the only monarch in my entire presentation, but it's like right in the corner there. So anywho, thank you so much. Um, let me stop sharing and I will put all those links there. Yeah, thank you, Richard. Um, Izzy, if you could um, let us know if we have any specific questions for Richard. Um, and I just wanted to, to be clear, Richard, you, you're you promoting the Monarch count around Thanksgiving and Christmas, and they can register for, register for that through Xerces. And then they can go to CMPS, which is California Native Plant Society, Santa Monica, and uh, do uh, Sepulveda Basin restoration through there? Yes. Well, I'm kind of, uh, were you asking a question? I, it got a lot of lost there. I just want to answer Susan's yeah, if, question. If, that I, put, I put all my links in the chat. Um, so if, if my presentation went a little fast, because I really don't want to, uh, the last presentation went a little long, so I didn't want to bleed too much into the next presentation. But I put all my links oh, in it's the all chat for volunteering with CNPS, working at the Sepulveda Basin, my email address if you want to talk my head off about activism, how to read EIRs and show up to government meetings and get all angry and stuff. Yeah, please contact me. And I put all the links there, Susan. So if you want to link, look up some of those links, I have them there. Antonio, was that, did that answer your question? I'm sorry. Yeah, I'll, I'll let Izzy go. But I think while we're talking, if you could just put your, your screen up again. Um, oh, yeah, I, mean, yeah, I, love look, yeah. I love looking at you, Richard, but I'd rather look at the context for, for the restoration. Oh, yeah, yeah. Maybe, so sorry. maybe the Sepulveda stuff. Izzy? Yeah, so I didn't really see too many specific questions in here, but um, there is one from Gwen talking about monarch eggs. If you can answer that, she's saying, what do you think about the ability to purchase monarch eggs to raise and release butterflies? I'm sure it's educational, but I wonder how that affects population genetics. Um, I would not do that. <laughs> the short answer is um, monarchs. So there's residential monarchs, right? And then there's like migrating monarchs. So residential monarchs, if you raise eggs at home and you release them, right? You're, there's like a 99% chance your monarchs are gonna end up becoming residential. Um, they might even interbreed with the migrating monarchs, which there's new up and coming research that's suggesting that this is negatively impacting migrating monarchs and converting migrating monarchs into residential monarchs, which then become like pools for um, this protozoan and other kind of diseases, right? Um, so I would just, that, that's kind of why I really wanted to emphasize this presentation on working with existing organizations, right? I, I think having native plants in your yard is super important. I think everyone should be gardening with native plants. I also really want to emphasize go doing restoration in existing wild spaces, right? Um, the Sepulveda Basin is pretty wild, but I would say even more so than that, what like tree people's doing and what like the resource conservation districts, like Ventura County Resource Conservation District, the Resource Conservation District of the Santa Monica Mountains, what they're doing, they get money to go into these existing spaces. CNPS does this a lot where we, we do restoration in wild spaces and we're actually helping right? Um, when you, you're at home and you're like capturing monarchs or buying eggs online, like there's a lot more room for error, right? Like that's kind of taking things into your own hands and excuse my language of playing God, I guess. But like when you're like working with like scientists and like land managers and indigenous nations, when you're like working with experts on the ground, um, that's when your impact is the highest, I would say. I, I hope that makes sense. There's like the so-called basin stuff. 
Yeah, I think that answered it pretty well. Um, so someone else was asking, is the CSUN garden open for volunteering and for people to come and see right now? Right. So we have a protocol. So the answer is yes and no. So we have a protocol where if you want to volunteer and you contact us, we'll send you COVID-19 uh, survey where you'll take the survey, confirm that you don't, you know, you're not exhibiting any symptoms for COVID-19 and then you'll come volunteer with us. So we do have, we are, we currently do have volunteers coming to the garden uh, and we're about to start a really cool uh, climate core program we're, we're paying, we get to pay a bunch of interns, um, myself included, I guess. And we're gonna be doing um, a lot of different projects, kind of reimagining what we can do with that space in terms of native plant propagation, um, coffee, mixed coffee orchard, fruit orchard, kind of um, the situation with like donating um, food to food pantries. We've got a lot of really funky stuff in the pipeline. So yes, you could absolutely come. I'll teach you a ton about invasive species. I'll teach you as much as I can and that I've been learning from Antonio about native plants. Um, yeah, come come volunteer, it's a, it's a lot of fun. We have a really, it's about an acre big. Um, we have endangered species like the Davidson's Bushmallow from the San Fernando Valley and um, uh, what is it? What is Berberus nevinia? Nevin's bayberry. Yeah, we have a bunch of Nevin's bayberry. We have a tory pine and we have a tory pine for uh, like native plant garden. We got a bunch of really cool stuff. So come, come volunteer. Yeah. Any other questions? I think there are, there's a few uh, general questions in the chat as far as like, um, uh, is Sustainability Institute Garden the same as the CSUN Botanical Garden? No. So that's a very good question. Those are two very different spaces. So the CSUN Institute for Sustainability, CSUN Food Garden, that's going to be on the north side of campus towards the dorms, um, slightly south of North, Northridge Academy, the high school. Um, like, I think it's a magnet school, but it's like slightly south of that um, high school, like near the baseball fields. The botanical garden, which is closed to the public until the fall, and then it might even be closed in the fall, that's near Chaparral Hall by the biology building. Um, that place is magical. It's absolutely magical. And they have a ton of milkweed there. And Brenda Kano does a fantastic job managing it. And in the fall, if you're interested in volunteering with Brenda, the CSUN Botanic Garden might be the best botanic garden in the San Fernando Valley. I said it fight me. I really love it. You'll love it too. Volunteer with Brenda and you'll learn a ton. So um, shout out to the CSUN Botanic Garden. It's so cool. Oh my gosh. It doesn't just have native plants, but it has a ton of native plants. So it's really cool. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you, Richard, very much. Um, big hug, brother. Um, yeah, you look... You look almost like Bob Allen with that that beard. Okay, so I thought someone was going to bring that up. Um, I like to think that I started growing out my beard before I met Bob Allen. I recently <laughs> met him because of my work with SoCal Botanist, but um, Bob Allen's really cool. And I, I hope to accomplish just a fraction of what he's accomplished in his life. So, yeah. Well, thank you for all your energy and your, your time in doing this work, Richard. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, so uh, there's a few uh, questions about who's putting this uh, conference on. I'm not even sure anymore that we're still here. I, we're to our very last speaker, um, but we haven't had enough chance, I don't think, to even just promote ourselves. We've been doing a very bad job. And so who is putting this conference on is SAMO Fund. We work directly with the National Park Service here in the Santa Monica Mountains. Um, we get to run the nursery here on their property. We, we do a lot of things apart from plants. Um, but I'll encourage you guys, if you're interested in supporting this work, which is completely free today, um, to go to samofund.org. We'll put the slide up after this last speaker and support our work. We're trying to hire three part-time youth this summer. Uh, we call it Mission Milkweed. And we're trying to get over 2 million milkweed seed collected, which sounds like a lot but it's actually a very small amount of pods 
Um, if each pod has about 100 to 200 seed in it, um, it's actually not too much seed. And our goal is to start bulking it here at the nursery so we can give seed away so that we can grow um, plants and give plants away to community gardens, to restoration sites, to homeowners, et cetera. So um, there's the link in the chat right there. I'm gonna pass it over to Ashley and Ashley is gonna introduce us to our final speaker. Unfortunately, um, our final speaker was not able to attend this afternoon, Josh um, from Natives for Nature. We had a last second um, uh, a work, a uh, work issue just a few days ago, but we were lucky enough to, to record him yesterday evening. And uh, so um, Ashley's gonna pay, play his, uh, his recording and um, we'll, we'll end it, um, we'll say goodbye with a few words after Josh's words. Yeah, awesome, thanks. It was really great uh, meeting with Josh and getting his perspective. So we'll go ahead and play that now. Give me one second, I'm sorry. Sorry, technical difficulties. Okay, that's better. It was playing this morning, <laughs> and that's always how it works on these Zooms, right? I think, did you, if you unshare your screen, and uh, and then try to share it again. And then before you do, you do share it. Go on the on the left. I think there's a way to um, what is it? Maximize or something like that? Optimize yeah. the video. Okay. Let me try like refreshing this page. Miha Noone Shivagnavi, Nonim Herka, Noiha, Tomachar, Wishkoneha. My name is Joshua Andujo. I'm a tribal member of the Gabalino Tongva, San Gabriel Band of Michigan Indians, and I'm also the founder of Natives for Nature. We are a community ran organization based out of traditional Tongva territory. Tongva territory is from Malibu to Laguna Beach, the four Channel Islands, going into San Bernardino. We shared, so when I tell people with the tribal maps and all that stuff, like, yes, it shows the areas we were in, but it doesn't really show the areas that we shared. Northern Los Angeles County, we shared with the Chumash, the San Fernando Valley, we shared with the Tataviam, San Bernardino, Riverside County, obviously we shared with the Serrano and the Cahuilla people, and then Orange County with the Ahashiman. Hey boys, I want to know what exactly my organization is. And to be honest, I would say we're a variety of different things because we're constantly growing. We do everything from trash cleanups. That could be anywhere from the ocean. We just had one in the LA River. We do some in the San Gabriel Mountains. We do fire prevention cleanups where we'll pick up debris and any other flammable materials that could be anywhere again from the mountains. We also do it in the inner city areas. We did one in Whittier Narrows Nature Center since that's the location of my ancestral village. A few more cleanups in the LA Riverbed that's gonna be coming up later in the, I wanna say later towards the end of the year. Gonna have a hike coming up in October at Tongva Peak. Then we're gonna be doing one at Cucamonga Peak and one at Mount Baldy for anybody that's into backpacking or hiking, more than welcome to join us. Do survival workshops. Cultural workshops, we'll do native plants, share um, on top surface information, whatever is shareable with public. We also do survival community hikes as well. We teach people how to go hiking, backpacking, camping, stuff like that. Actually, we have a hike coming up June, June 11th at Sandstone Peak in uh, Malibu, if anybody else wants to join us for that. Yeah, I teach people survival stuff. 
for anything that want to know like what type of items to carry with you at all times in your backpack, in your cars, or anything that you want to need in your house. If you're in wilderness survival, then I teach people how to do fires, how to sustain a fire, how to put out fires, compass and land navigation, wilderness first aid. I don't give out the certification for that part. I just teach people like just basic common sense, what to do and how to react to certain things. Obviously, if you're not certified, I don't want you to put yourself in jeopardy and the person you're trying to help. So like I just teach basic stuff on like how to react until professional help gets there. Another thing when I was saying about cultural stuff, I do try to make everything cultural related. So with the survival stuff, I know that that's something that we're learning about from the warrior culture that our warriors would do survival training as well. So I thought that was interesting that we're bringing that back. And I guess in a modern perspective, hiking, obviously that was our transportation back in the day, taking trade routes. So I teach people certain things that are, like I said, that is shareable. Um, we are trying to get more hikes within the San Gabriel Mountains, since a lot of the people on my that support my organization don't really have a lot of experience. So I do try to teach people the basic stuff before even going out there. Oh, we also do native gardening restoration projects. We do work with local organizations that do try to bring back um, native habitats. We do community native gardens. Trying to bring back a necklace workshop in the memory of mine, Julia, but we still got to figure that out. Probably aiming more towards November towards the like towards the end of our acorn festival I want to do like necklace related jewelry of acorn I should say uh, acorn related jewelry Claremont and towards November that's the acorn festival that's another one that's open to the public with things opening up and events are starting to happen again hopefully we start going out there because it's been a long time but I want to say the event coming up that I know of for sure well, that would have been coming up is Moon Patam. It's at the Long Beach Aquarium. And that's an interesting event because it's not just Tonga related. It's all the coastal tribes of Southern California. So you have a variety of Tonga, Hashiman, Chumash, Ohlone. You know, you have different. I know my tribe with COVID and everything, we're trying to keep uh, safety and stuff like that. We're going to be having the beach gathering or the beach day the community beach day that's going to be in july if anybody wants to see anything of our tribe i do recommend going to heritage park in santa fe springs california they do have a village recreation site right there if you're familiar with the audubon deb uh, deb the audubon center at deb's park they have another village recreation right there um mount baldy visiting center is another the Many Winters Gathering of Elders in San Pedro, that's usually at the end of October. And that's more of, like, I guess a ceremony that's open to the public. I know they do have protocol of, like, no recording and taking pictures. But it is a chance for non-Native people to experience a ceremony and to share with not just California tribes, but you have tribes from all over. I've met people from Canada, met people from South America and Mexico. So it's interesting for everybody that comes together during this time of the year towards uh, um, October. The history behind that was when the city of Los Angeles was honoring Christopher Columbus during that time. So the native community out here decided, well, instead of honoring Christopher Columbus, like this is a way of native people to heal. And yeah, I recommend everybody go and check that out. When we do start having um, cultural events, I will be posting them on Natives for Nature. Pitzer College, I know they have a couple of Tongva murals about our people. If you ever have the time to go out there and check it out, I do recommend them. I know they're by uh, Joe Galarza. Oh, another thing too, um, now that it, museums are starting to open up, uh, if you ever have time to go to the Natural History Museum of Los Angeles, I know they have an exhibit on us. Um, we are going to have a Tiat display, which is one of our plain canoes. Us and the Chumash are the, probably the only tribes that I know of that did use plain canoes out in the ocean. So they have a display of that. They have a display of our jewelry. A few other things. I know they mentioned about the mission era as well. And after, like the Mexican era, then going into the Mexican um, American era. 
but there's also a video that they show of Tongva people nowadays. And it's, again, like I said earlier, it's showing about what we are nowadays, cultural educators or anything like that. The Autry Museum, I don't know if that's going to be opening up anytime soon, but they also have a nice exhibit about California natives. They have a lot of our art, um, don't really call them artifacts. We call them ancestral creations, but they have a lot of our stuff right there. I think I want to call it Bowers Museum in Santa Ana. I could be getting the name wrong, but that's another history museum in Santa Ana. They have some of our stuff right there as well. If anybody's curious to ever learn stuff like that, I do recommend checking it out. Uh, Smith Park in San Gabriel, they have like a little plaque, but they also have a lot of our, um, it's like a little mirror, I guess, on tile, painted tile. They do have a lot of our stuff right there that's cultural related. They show like our key, our instruments, the stuff that we use to hunt, like our weapons, it has pictographs. That's another thing that's also interesting. Uh, Tongva Park in Santa Monica was also dedicated to us. You know, again, thank you for having me be a part of this and to share some stuff. Again, if you want to find out more information about my tribe or the organization, Natives for Nature, that's the only social media platform that we're on as of right now. But yeah, uh, I just want to say thank you for having me be a part of this. Yeah, I uh, just want to let people know that it is a Tongva-led organization, Natives for Nature, and um, just wanted to let people know that we are out there, we're still here, and that we're doing everything that everybody else is doing in today's time. Yeah, just to make ourselves visible, you know, that's something that Matt and Julie wanted for us to be visible, so this is my way of letting people know that my tribe's still here and that like I said, we're doing the exact same work that everybody else is doing out there. You know, we're not just cultural people. We are people of educators. We are musicians, artists of different types, politicians. You know, we do a lot of stuff. And here I wanted for Natives for Nature is just get people out of nature. You know, you don't need a thing I like to tell people is you don't need to be na uh, native to attend our events, you know, because at one point in time, our ancestors were native to somewhere, you know, so this is my way of getting people out there. And um, now that it's summertime, we're going to be doing community beach gatherings for whoever's comfortable, you know, and obviously in small groups and stuff like that, respecting COVID protocol. But like I said, just to get people out there in nature, yeah, hopefully bring a, a educational perspective to my workshops, you know, letting people know that why our connection to nature is so important. And, you know, obviously for us, Tongva people, we didn't have a word for nature because we were part of nature. You know, we all needed each other to survive. You know, we needed the animals and we needed the land and we all needed to live with each other and to learn from each other in order to survive. So if anybody wants uh, information to find out more about like uh, how to volunteer support. Our Instagram is natives, the number four, nature. We're going to be having a mountain cleanup coming up soon with my cousin's organization, Canyon City Environmental Project out of Azusa. People want to probably want to know what the word for butterfly is. Couldn't find the exact word for monarch, but for butterfly in our language, it would have been ataba. And um, the only thing I was trying to find out too for the milkweed related of like what we use, I do know that we use um, we use it for string and fiber to make rope, like a cordage. That was the only thing I could really get on that type of stuff. I'm sure there's other Tongva people out there that are more influent because uh, the plants is not really my thing. I'm a cultural dancer for the San Gabriel band. Yeah, if anybody wants to find out more information on us, though, you know, feel free to follow Natives for Nature. If you have any questions or anything like that, I know we're going to be posting more dates as time goes by. But like I said, as of right now, we just have those main things that I mentioned, the hikes, the mound cleanups that's going to be coming up. Again, I'm still waiting for my cousin's different, uh, organization to give me like a specific date and everything like that. Like I said, we, we wanted to have Josh here, um, but he had uh, some other commitments to go to. I really thank you, Josh, for recording that last minute for us last night. And for Ashley, too, for putting that together. 
very last minute. Thank you. Um, so Josh is at on Instagram natives for the, the number four natives for nature. Um, and he, he had an LA river cleanup, um, last weekend and he's hoping to have some more events going forward. So this is the time when we want to, um, start to say goodbye. Ashley, could you throw the slideshow on there for us? Or Izzy, if you guys, if, if one of you can. Um, so I just want to give thanks to my compa, my friend Rico, who opened us up, and to Josh, who helped close us up, and to the amazing speakers who came today. It, I'm, I'm, I think it went pretty good for being a, a free <laughs> event that had very little experience behind the, the scenes here. Ashley, you did amazing. Izzy, you did amazing. Leslie, you did amazing. Um, you can find us. You can hold your phone up and scan to find how to donate and support these things. I want to do another one next year. We want to do all sorts of conferences, and we want to go collect millions of milkweed seed, and we want to make them free for the community. Everyone, from the folks who hang out in the back of the 7-Elevens to the folks who own the 7-Elevens. We want to I don't know why I'm talking about 7-Eleven, maybe because Andy was talking about that 7-Eleven out by Oxnard College. I know very well, Andy, if you're still on, bought many of Mickey's right there. But anyways, I want to give a huge hug to everyone who is still here. We started with close to 500 people. We have 240 people still here. Un gran abrazo para todos mis amigos, mis compadres. Thank you guys for sticking around. I encourage you guys to please reach out to whoever you felt closest to um, these folks are here for you. Josh is here for you. I'm here for you. Um, Noe at Yes Yes Nursery is there for you. She wants to show you how to do your own nursery. Um, Andy wants to get you involved in Ventura County. Richard wants to connect with you in Northridge. The CMPS in Santa Monica wants you in the Sepulveda cleaning up. Um, so part of the goal is to get this information free and put it in your hands. We're not powerless almost ever. Things can be hard, but we're almost never powerless. So hopefully you guys have the power. The five things we wanna encourage you guys to do at this second is to cut back your tropical milkweeds from November to March. Make sure that they're cut back. Plant native milkweeds, plant native milkweeds, plant pollinator plants so that the monarchs can sip early and late don't, plant, don't spray pesticides in your gardens, por favor. That stuff lasts forever and it will, it will hurt your, your babies. And just talk to your neighbors if you can. Talk to your landscapers. And um, instead of being afraid and being sad sometimes, let's have the power. So um, I just want to close it with what uh, Rico told us that morning, that when we take care of local milkweeds, we take care of local monarchs and we take care of local people and that's what this conference is all about thank you guys for making uh ashley izzy leslie and my dreams come true i remember when we had the conversation six weeks ago are we going to do this we have no speakers i guess so so i encourage you guys to stay tuned with us on instagram on samo fun we're thinking about doing other conferences like propagation conferences landscape maintenance conferences, native food conferences. So we can only do that with your support. So thank you guys very, very much. Un gran abrazo. Izzy, Ashley, Leslie, do you guys have anything that you want to say to the people? Uh, yep, really quickly, I'd like to add, um, we can send um, an email with links for all of the speakers who talked today out to you guys. If you um, need that all in one place, we can send that out. So feel free to reach out to them. And thank you. <laughs> yeah, a super huge thanks to all of our speakers and our sponsors. Um, we will get the recordings out to you guys or either on our YouTube, just anywhere where it's accessible. Um, and I'd love to end us with a quote um, from one of my teachers. He says, hope grows, hope lasts, hope gives. Hope begins with what goes unseen, but it grows when we believe in it. It is that belief and dedication that hope continues to grow and inspire. 
Thank you, everyone. And I hope you have a, a great rest of your day. Leslie, can you make that full screen so people can, can, or they go, actually, sorry. Thank you guys. Yeah. Can you make that full screen? The um. Uh...